Ho, ho, ho. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas from the Night King. <laughs> oh, silent night. Here we are. It's December, everyone, so I figured we'd kick things off proper, get everyone in the mood. And, of course, I am actually doing a Alisan at the Wall video, which I'll have out in a couple days. So this will be a little bit of prep for that uh, because we'll be talking about the Night Fort. So, yeah. Um, the Night Fort is is a dark place. It's George's horror writing coming to the surface. Uh, there's lots of spooky tales, and that means we're going to get to talk about Night's King and Night's Queen, the Others, the Wall, the Night's Watch, Baby Sacrifice, all kinds of fun things that damn well <laughs> the, the Blackgate we would face. So, lots to talk about, and uh, we're going to... This is a chapter reread. We've done this format before, but we're going back to it now. And essentially what it means is that we're going to read through the chapter. We're going to highlight all the interesting stuff. It's basically a close reading. That's what this is called. And this is really the best way to ring out the, uh, the detail of what George is writing is doing. And especially in these, these uh, uh, all-star Hall of Fame chapters that I like to pull for these, so... I am just kind of waking up. I recorded late last night. My schedule's completely fucked, so excuse me if uh, if I have to. Oh, French. Yes, French. Um, yeah, but uh, I'm caffeinated. I'm here. Kelly Johnson says, so glad to get away from House of the Dragon into a Song of Ice and Fire Mythos. Don't say so glad, Kelly. House of the Dragon was good times. We had fun with that. We had fun with that. Yes, we did. Um, let me just adjust my... There we go. But that being said... It is time to turn back to A Song of Ice and Fire, and one of the first things that seemed like uh, appropriate to do was essentially to talk about Aegon's prophecy and all the ramifications for the story. And the more we think about it, the more it seems to, well, impact the story from Aegon all the way down to Rhaegar and Lyanna. So that's been fun to talk about, and this Jaehaerys Alisan video that I got is going to be a monster. Um, so yeah, we're getting back into A Song of Ice and Fire, and to prepare for the Jaehaerys and Alisan one, we're going to do this deep dive on the Night Fort. Basically, all the Night Fort goodness is saved up until Bran gets there. George doesn't really build it up much before Bran gets to the Night Fort, and then as he's getting there, George is just reeling out one scary story after another. So it's a pretty delightful chapter. And to help me read it, I have a good friend of mine, the one Talk Studios, also known as Carter. Hello, Carter. Say hello. Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you doing? Yeah, you're coming through I good. I Kindle working. Yes, sound is good. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> and just real quick, tell everyone about your channel, where to find you, what you're doing, what kind of stuff they could find there. I'm Talk Studios on all socials. That's T-A-W-K Space Studios. Uh, we do video breakdowns, uh, commentary, comedy uh, type videos. It's just a lot of fun. We try to have fun. Yeah, there's, some, there's all kinds of fun topics on there, including a little pop talk, as they say. We dabble. Praise Garth. Yes, we got it. So just real quick, uh, the art below me, uh, the uh, in the lower right of your screen, you'll see that Night Fort Weirwood Tree. That's by Iveson Wild, and on the lower left, you see the Night Fort. Uh, that Night Fort is by oh shoot, uh, I had the name in my head just a second ago. It is a very old Night Fort picture. It's low res. It's from one of those cards, Carter. The uh, the old, uh, what's it called? The, it's like a Game of Thrones card game or something. And it is uh, okay. Franz Milkis. Uh, Miklis. Franz Miklis. That's who it is. All right. So, you ready to go to the, the Night Fort, game. Mr. Carter? I'm ready. I was, uh, do you know the chapter number? I got the Kindle pulled up now. So, it's, it's Bran 4, and the chapter is um, going to be 56. Newly downloaded Kindle e-reader. Thank you, Carter. Appreciate that. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Amazon. Thank you, Amazon. This reading is brought to you by Amazon. <laughs> hey there. Easy. 
They're not paying me. <laughs> no, you said that they have to pay you now. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's right. Yes, that's how it works. You got to dress for the job you want. Well, good thing I didn't sign up to advertise for established titles, though. Boy. Ooh. Right? That got dark. In case you didn't hear, feel free to look that one up. But uh, yeah, that's a big old oof right there. Got yeah, it. and there's still a ton of videos that have them, you know, as our sponsor ongoing too. So, it's so as of a, so as of a day or two ago, they actually just pulled all of their advertising. Okay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that affects videos that are already scheduled to be posted that have it like clipped under their videos and stuff, or if they're just like telling everyone, no, no. Who knows? Their communication has not been good. So, uh, yeah. See, that's the thing, Carl <laughs> Karsnack, is you're not you're not actually a laird. You, you don't own any land in Scotland. The whole <laughs> thing is uh, is bunk and hooey, as it turns out. But yes. Yeah, you have to go get your season. You got to go get your dirt in hand, just to make sure. Always, always get your dirt in hand. Yeah. So don't don't show up to Scotland and start bugging anybody with a kilt or a long beard about where your land is. That's not going to go well. So. So yeah, um, sorry, a little, little sidetrack there, but uh, every, almost everybody has heard of established titles because they do. Uh, they did make a has big push and they were advertising with a lot of people. Let me actually pull up the video that I was watching about it just so I can give people an easy link. Uh, there's somebody that's been doing good work as Soundgarden plays a little bit, that's fine. <laughs> Everyone knows I like Soundgarden. This stream is off to a good start. All right, let's see. Established titles scam. I do. I do want to. I do want to put everybody onto this because, uh, like I said, they did get around a lot. A lot of people advertised with them. Uh, Scott Schaffer, that's who has done the investigative reporting. Other people have looked into it too, but he's just made a couple of videos that have really been. Uh, He's even got the law and order sound effect. So you got to like that. Here, I'll drop the link real quick. So yeah, that's his YouTube channel. He's got a couple of videos on there. Uh, but yeah, the truth comes out. Where's the 1899 stream? Glad you asked. Glad you asked. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot more than just a stream coming. I'm starting a new YouTube channel I again. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm... It's going to be for non A Song of Ice and Fire media, and specifically it's going to be for psychedelic flavored media like 1899, like Dark. I might go back for some classic psychedelic books and movies. Um, just yes. anything that's messing with reality and perception and stuff like that. It's kind of my jam. So look for lots of 1899 stuff coming in January. January is kind of a down month for ad revenue, so it doesn't really pay to like work on a Daenerys video, say, for two months, and then release it in January. That's not a good plan, Carter, um, hmm, okay. by the way, just speaking from experience. So this January, I will be doing, um, be working on some mythic concepts and some 1899 stuff. But the point is, we're going to close out, what is it, 2022, strong with the Song of Ice and Fire material all December. So that's the plan. But yes, in January, I'll be lots of 1899 stuff. So you may have to wait a second, but we'll get there. Kolnitsky says he owns land. He's own, he owns 600 square meters. Well, you probably didn't get that through established titles, did you? <laughs> no, no, no. I no. bought I bought 600 of them. Like no. Oh boy. <laughs> square meters. No, they promised the full the full. They square. promised. That's right. I've got 600 trees, one per meter, There's just all in a row. Trees. It's like a grid. <laughs> I don't know how people pictured that. Anyways, <laughs> they're very I tiny know. trees. I, I think they just. They just assumed that no one would travel up to Scotland to go check it out. They did assume that, Carter. They That's did, the yes. <laughs> oh, man. All right. This this established title stuff's really got me. Okay, so Bran. Bran 4. All right. So, uh, as you know, set up there, it's Mira Reed, Jojen, Hodor. Uh, they're all trooping around. Um, they are trying to get through the wall. That's basically the setup. So it is only another empty castle. Mira Reed said as she gazed across the desolation of rubble, ruins, and weeds. No, thought Bran, it is the night fort. And this is the end of the world. 
And they talk about, they call the wall the end of the world a lot. So that's kind of, that's what that's about. <clears throat> Unless there's a double meaning, Carter. Dun, dun, dun. In the mountains. <laughs> what do you think? Could be. Could well, be. you know, I actually went through and recorded all the quotes about the wall being the end of the world. And there's like 14 of them. So I'm thinking that maybe when the long night falls, the wall's going to like fall down or something. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. Were you picking up on some vibes like that from the other quotes? Yep, epic... uh, definitely feeling the vibes. Yep, <laughs> like definitely. God, God and uh, up on a up on a wall fighting energy. Yeah, no, I mean, really, uh, if you think about it, that's the whole thing about Alice Ann not being able to fly her dragon over the wall. It just kind of tells you, like, the wall's going to have to come down for these two sides to fight each other. You know, the, it seems like maybe the others and the dragons, neither one of them can cross the wall. Which maybe is the point. So it's coming down mm -hmm. for sure. Like a curtain. And it is actually described as a curtain. Uh, don't get me started on wall symbolism. Anyways, um, let's see here. Uh, yes, the end of the world. In the mountains, all he could think of was reaching the wall and finding the three-eyed crow. But now that they were here, he was filled with fears. The dream he'd had. The dream Summer had had. No, I mustn't think about that dream. He had not even told the reeds, though Mira at least seemed to sense that something was wrong. If he never talked of it, maybe he could forget he ever dreamed it, and then it wouldn't have happened. And Rob and Greywind would still be... Ah, so Bran's actually seen the Red Wedding. <laughs> That's how we're starting this chapter. <laughs> I mean, he's definitely trying to forget it. He, uh, he doesn't even want to remember that he was in Summer's body like that. He's... Uh, he's already getting traumatized from some of the skin changing he's doing early on. Yeah, so that's uh, that's how we're, the man with David is my friend Carter. He's uh, he's uh, he's my homie to my left today. That's that's Carter from Talk Studios, and uh, the link to his channel is in the description below the video. It's also in the chat. Also in the chat. <clears throat> um, so yes, that's how we're starting off, Bran apparently caught some vision of the red wedding which was completely awful and uh he's trying not to think about it as they go to the night fort that should work out well hodor hodor shifted his weight and bran with it he was tired they had been walking for hours at least he's not afraid bran was scared of this place and almost as scared of admitting it to the reeds i'm a prince of the north a stark of winterfell almost a man grown i have to be as brave as rob as brave as Rob, whom he just was thinking about getting murdered. It's like, yeah, be brave, like the, my brother who got murdered. Sweet, that's inspiring. Um, he, he held no fear, though, Rob, you know, supposedly. You know, at least he wasn't hiding under a table or something. That's oh, no, for sure. He, he went out, he went out uh, like a Stark. Um, I'm just, he, yeah, it's like the courage that the Starks are trying to summon up is a grim thing. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, definitely courage, but grim. Uh, did I see a super chat go back? Yes, I did. Uh, Garth Greenlung, catching it on the rewatch. Cheers, buddy. Thank you. Um, let's see. Okay. So, Jojen gazed up at him with his dark green eyes. There's nothing here to hurt us, Your Grace. Bran wasn't so certain. The Night Fort had figured in some of Old Nan's scariest stories. It was here that Night's King had reigned, before his name was wiped from the memory of man. This is where the rat cook had served the Andal King his prince and bacon pie, where the seventy-nine sentinels stood their watch, where brave young Danny Flint had been raped and murdered. This was the castle where King Sherrit had called down his curse on the Andals of old, where the Prentice boys had faced the thing that came in the night, where blind Simeon Star Eyes had seen the hellhounds fighting. Mad Axe had once walked these yards and climbed these towers, butchering his brothers in the dark. So that's the appetizer slate of Night Fort right. Spooky Tales. Some of those, I mean, like I remember listening to it the first time, but whenever I, I, I usually listen to them on Audible, and the, as you can tell by me needing to download the Kindle edition. But uh, when I was listening to it, like the King Sherrod calling down curses on the Andals, like the old Andals, that was some stuff that jumped out where you're just like, we don't hear about wizards up at 
up on the wall very often. What is, what's this guy doing dark sorcery? The only time we usually hear, well, the only other time I remember hearing about that was uh, when they talk about Knight's King using sorcery over like his homies after he takes the queen and goes back to the wall. Yeah, actually, you're totally right. Um, who the hell is this guy? Why is he a king at the Night Fort? Was this another Night's Watchman who declared himself king? Was this a king of, like a king of winter that came to the watch? Is Was that Sherrod Stark? We, we, <laughs> no idea. Right? I wonder, I always think when, the, I mean... You know, on rules uh, of interpretation, you always think when they give you lists like this that they're doing it for a reason. And if they're, you know, they're telling one story, he always tells multiple layers, but you're telling one story here, which is the history of the night for it. But usually, like when Old Nan uh, hypothesizes about who the night, night King, like what family the Night King actually comes from, I feel like the list that she gives, you can take those and kind of look into those to give context to who the person might be. The same thing here. It's like, none of this really makes sense, but when you kind of read them together, you can start to get a sense of maybe what had happened at the wall around the time of the Night's King and some of the people that were involved and who were under the curse, the people that were going crazy while he was there and some of that stuff. I do think that's how you've got to read this. Uh, this stuff. When George gives you a lot of ideas at once, sort of drop the details and look at the themes and the shapes and the symbols that are going on, at least for a few, you know, do the regular reading also. But when you look at it that way, yeah, you can start to see what's going on. It's it's a place where, kind of like Heron Hall, it's almost like a black hole of human events. And anything that happens here just turns really, really dark, or it hints at some sort of dread power. It's like Simeon Star Eyes is another one it's just really hard to figure out what that's about. Star Eyes, well, that sounds like the others, obviously, but we know the Fire Whites have, like, red star eyes as well. And mm -hmm. he's blind, and he's got a stick that he swirls around with blades on either end so he could chop people. Look at what's going on here. And then he's watching Hellhounds fight at the wall. Is that, is that Dire Wolves? Is that... So it's like, yeah, there's just, and I don't know that there's an answer necessarily to some of this stuff. Um, much like how George wrote Fire and Blood without having an answer, like, I'm going to throw out three things. He didn't decide which was true. He just wrote it like that. So with these tales, like, some of these, there may not be a deeper explanation. But I do think, Carter, that you're right, that, like, some of this stuff might be giving us clues about the most important thing that ever happened at the Night Fort, which is Knights, King, and Queen, right? Yeah, and uh, I think you were talking about how uh, some of these places like Heron Hall and uh, the Wall, the, the Night Fort, where they have this really dark history, uh, you know, those are the places around the world where history is really muddied. Like you'll get just these little tidbits of history where it's, it's almost like each one of these is like a little myth on its own that was passed down that we only got a piece of, like the... Simeon Star Eyes had seen Hellhounds fighting sounds more like uh, them referencing a vision, you know, that Simeon Star Eyes had about the, the Night Fort and Hellhounds fighting at the Night Fort and that it's told in reference to that more than, you know, Simeon being at the wall necessarily or the Hellhounds actually being there, almost like the vision of John on the wall fighting with the Flaming Sword. Mute, I think you muted party time mute as i sometimes am yes um <laughs> uh, my best interpretation of that is kind of complimentary like hell eventually when um the hellhounds fighting part seemed to start to make sense to me and some of the myth heads because the others are like wolves they have wolf symbolism and the starks are like wolves and then there's all this stuff about like in order to guard against the wolves you take one of them in and train it to defend the flock so there's this whole thing about the Starks being like tamed wolves that defend the flock, kind of. Um, and of course, mm -hmm. the Starks and the others are very parallel. They might have the blood of the other, the Starks. The Starks, may maybe they used to give babies 
to the others. Knight's King was probably a Stark, on and on and on. And so, the Starks team up with the people beyond the wall to take down Knight's King. It's almost that's like also true, right. Joraman teamed up with Brandon the Breaker to, to take down Knight's King. So the Hellhounds fighting could be like the others and the Starks, essentially, is, is kind of what I'm getting at. Um, and Simeon Star Eyes, obviously some kind of magical person. The one thing that I was wondering about is, is Simeon Star Eyes a clue that there was once a human that had blue star eyes, wielded ice magic, but was not an other? Um, I speculated mm. that maybe there was a Stark that was like an ice wizard or ice priestess, like Melisandre as a fire witch. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's like Brandon the Builder. Because like, if he built the wall out of ice... And the, and the wall's built out of magic. Like, somebody knows how to build things with ice and magic. So it was either the others, or there was a human wizard, a Stark, who could. So there's your first wild theory. Like, maybe Bran the Builder was a star-eyed dude, you know, but not under the control of the others. I can see that. Or maybe there's some more complex reality where the original... Knight's King or Knight's Queen isn't just a villain, but rather this complex figure that's trying to keep the sides apart. And that's who built the wall. Um, so there's a lot of, that's one of the reasons why it's so fun to talk about the White Walkers is because it's one of the things that there is still so much mystery about. And the show tried really hard to make them boring, um, but <laughs> they are still right. cool. The White Walkers are still cool. Of a stark enemy. Sorry, say it again. I said they just made him into like an amorphous dark enemy, you know, yeah. and then in the end it was just stabbing him with the magic, you know, the magic dagger. Spoiler alert. But the basically the exact thing that George said they're not. <laughs> so yeah, right? Yeah. Uh but you were talking about the wall. Uh I know we'll get to it uh in this chapter, but you were talking about the magic and like who put up the wall and what the purpose of the wall was. I think things like dragons not being able to pass over, like cold hands not being able to pass through while the Black Brothers are able to, like those are supposedly the only people that are allowed to pass through, but something along the way that happened to cold hands made it to where whatever spells ward off everyone except for the Night's Watch now affect him. Yeah, so it, and Cold Hands explains it in by just saying that he's dead essentially. So dead things can't cross the wall. Um, we actually don't know if the others can cross the wall. It's more that we know that whites can't. Um, probably others can't, but we don't know that. Just just point of fact, we maybe they could just walk into the wall and absorb into it and pop out the other side for all we know. So <clears throat> yeah, that's not really a theory. I just threw. I'm just. <laughs> that was just a throw out. So reverse, yeah. reverse sentinel. But the king, yeah, exactly. But the king share it is interesting. He called down a curse on the Andals. So this would be during the days when the Andals were first, in, you know, invading Westeros some two to four thousand years ago. Although there's a lot of debate about that, obviously. Um, yeah, so there was some kind of king here at the Night Fort, either, like I said, a, a first man king. Or a, another Knight's King, you know, Knight's Watch commander who had appointed himself king. It's hard to say, but it's definitely uh, a chaotic place, let's say. And Mad Axe is one where I think they're going to come back to Mad Axe later in this chapter. So we'll talk about him in a minute. You want to pick up where it says all that happened? Uh, yes, I was I was going to say one more thing about... Oh, go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, yes. Just the fact that he was calling the curse down on the Andals specifically, I thought was interesting because that was the same, the same movement that led the the children to kind of take an aim at the Andals. Mm -hmm. You know, them moving up to the north. So it's interesting to see that whoever the king that ruled the castle in days of old was had a similar, you know vendetta against the Andals. They were aligned at some point, at least. Yeah, this sounds almost like the last gasp of some king that's like, he's been beaten back all the way to the wall, and he calls down a curse with his dying breath. You think of Garen 
you know, in his cage with the Roynar and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. And real quick, uh, Carter, let me just grab this super chat yeah, that came in. I got uh, one here. It says, what if Bran never fell? It was all a dream. And there's another Biggie reference. <laughs> also, um, all, also about being fearless. The great John Umber was fearless. Look what happened to him. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of, there's a, if you remember, there's a lot of lines in A Song of Ice and Fire where George talks about brave characters who just want to go out with a sword in their hand and a curse on their lips. And it's kind of like the warrior's ethos, dying a warrior's death. It's a very Viking kind of way to think. So that's that's the kind of fearless that the Starks are tapping into, I'd say. And it seems like all of the stories that we hear, like all of the, the people who remember man all speak of that type of bravery more like hubris than like a a valued trait you know that it seems more like when man's reflecting about uh people who were brave and who didn't have fear she was talking about the night king and she was talking about how big of a fool he was for uh not heeding you know the dangers of the north and that was the characteristic that they talk about being the reason why he chases after this dead chick up there. So that's that's a great point, a very important thematic point. So let's let's make the comparison. On one hand, we have Knight's King, a man who knew no fear, and that was the fault in him. So for him, it's hubris, meaning he doesn't even know fear. He doesn't have it. He doesn't know any caution. He's going to reach up and seize the fire of the gods. Thank you very much. And damn the torpedoes. Um, Ned Stark says, you can only be brave when you're afraid. So that's totally different. Being brave means feeling that fear and deciding to confront it, deciding that you're not going to be held captive to it. That is completely different than being oblivious to caution and fear and, uh, and wisdom. Right, Carter? Yes. Absolutely. I used to read Word Up magazine. Thanks, chat. Thank you. It's been a lot of Biggie this week. It, it, he just keeps coming up. I'm not sure why. It's Biggie. So uh, yeah, he's making his comeback. Still alive. This goes out to you. Theories, right? Always, Biggie lives forever. Um. So uh, let's see here, Eric Alden, and this is uh, this is a PayPal question I got before the stream. This is a really good question and relevant. When anyone dies north of the wall, do they automatically resurrect as whites or do they have to be killed by blood sacrifice or something like that to become whites? Thank you for your excellent analysis. We might also ask, do the others have to come along and specifically raise them? Like on the show, we see, we see the Night King doing his, you know, his arms up to raise them. I've always wondered about this, Carter, and I'm curious to hear your opinion. We don't know. Um, it's very interesting that first book, we've got Jafer Flowers mm -hmm. and Othor, the two Night's Watch Rangers that were with Benjen. They're found in the woods. Their eyes are blue, but they're motionless during the day. They bring them back to Castle Black, and then they wake up at night and try to kill people, the Lord Commander specifically. So they were already under the other's control, we know from the blue eyes, but they were dormant. So that really suggests that one of two things is happening. Either the whites always are dormant during the day, and that may be the case. Um, they're kind of sleep beneath the snow during the day, it seems like. It also may imply that the others can remote control puppet them and make them do stuff. So what's your opinion on all that? I mean, I think that... I think that... So on that one, they were... Were they on... Were they north of the wall and then they got brought to the wall and they woke up at night? Jafer and Othor. Uh, Correct. I think that it seems, so you remember in the opening, the prologue too, there were a bunch of bodies that were just laying there that uh, yes. are whited at some point, but it, you know we couldn't tell if they were like that there and like life being around activates them. You know, once they see a purpose they get up and they start moving towards it like zombies or uh, something like that you know once they sense brain they move towards brain uh or life in the scenario 
but I think, I don't think that being at the wall, like caused them to be raised because of like the wall's magic. I think it probably had something to do with being around people like non whites or living people again. That's another, yeah, it could be like a bloodhound thing. Like they smell the hot blood that, you know, and that's, that's something that is said about the others and the whites. Like, yeah, they smelled the hot blood in the last hero and they came after him. Um, so yeah, that could make sense as well. And I'm really glad you brought up that prologue. I'm a little cautious on drawing too many magical conclusions from the first book because George was, it was a long time ago and he's fleshed things out a lot since then. But those whites that, um, Will finds they're all dead and they're all laying around motionless. They've already been converted at that point. And then within the space of like an hour, however long it takes, you know, Will to go back to the party and for them to come back to that clearing, they're gone. And we never see them. They don't even attack them. They just disappear. So clearly what what's happened here is that the others are controlling the whites and have used them as a trap to lower these three rangers out into the open where they can fight them. That's, I don't see any other conclusion. So I think we can say that the others most likely can puppet the whites and basically make them do whatever they want. And in that scene, do, don't you remember them saying something about there not being any blood, like they all died of exposure or something and that they weren't killed, which is kind of to that question that they had. Correct. About whether they had to be killed or not. Yeah, exactly. That's why they concluded like, oh, it must have been frostbite at first because they're all just, they're not blood, they're not torn apart like on the TV show. They're just frozen in place. Um, even the one that's like up a tree, I think, or something like that. But uh, yeah, so great question there. Um, and I think the answer is that we don't know, but basically the others are in control. They can make the whites do more or less what they want. So anyone that dies north of the wall probably will become a white if they're left out for too long. It, it, for example, Ygritte is worried about that in the Frost Fangs. It mm -hmm. could be that that's others' territory, but um, we don't know for sure. Uh, but I wouldn't say automatically. I, th I think the others are in control of most parts of that process, if I had to guess. Um, got the Ovid. Oh, the Rona. But listening, Carol Funk says, thanks, David, for what you do. Well, happy to entertain you. Get well soon, Carol. And uh, there was another one here. Jay Lord says, Lord Eddard Stark liked John Umber, but always worried about fearlessness. Um, the Starks and the Umbers love each other, but I wonder how often the brave Starks um, bailed out their fearless Umbers. Well, yeah, you, you got to have that guy on your team, right? <laughs> yeah, right. The I Umbers are the Draymond of the North. There you go. <laughs> There's... Yeah. People love my Draymond references. All right, so um I think that's uh I think that's caught up. Oh, and I never answered. What if Brand never fell? Uh I don't think I mean, we've gone too far down on the, the story here to be like it was all a dream. So I mean, I do I do think there are there is some wonkiness with Bran uh coming, but I don't know how far it goes, so we'll have to see. I mean, I feel like that would be that's like one of the things that I feel like George talks about not being a fan of is having epic stories with all the symbolism, not have any significance in the actual life of any of the characters. Like at the end, there's, oh, oh, wow. I have that insight now as a person who we really haven't learned anything about. Yeah, yeah. And Preston, Preston's theory is that Bran is time traveling and that he's doing a kind of loop of actions over and over again until he can get the result that he wants. Um, but even that yeah. theory, which is interesting and, you know, pushing the limits of what could be possible is not speculating that, you know, it's, it was all a dream or it's not real or something like that. So we'll just have to see how far George goes with the timeline wonkiness. We know the green seers can sort of whisper across the years to people, um, and Bran may be able to do more, so we'll have to keep an eye on that. We know something like the Hodor event is coming. Mm -hmm. um, Dark Arts by Adrian says, so you guys agree you don't necessarily have to be killed violently in order to be resurrected as a white. No, I don't think the manner of death matters at all. I don't mm -hmm. think so. Those are ghost rules. 
<laughs> oh, right. Those are the ghost rules. Yeah. Well, George does use some ghost rules, but I don't think uh, I don't think those ones are in play here. Non-canon. Yeah. All right. So um, where were we? Uh, oh, yes. Them. All that happened hundreds and thousands of years ago. Take it away. All that had happened hundreds and thousands of years ago, to be sure. And some maybe never happened at all. Master Lewin always said that old man's stories shouldn't be swallowed whole. But once his uncle came to see father and Bran asked about the night fort, Benjamin Stark never said the tales were true, but he never said they weren't. He only shrugged and said, we left the night fort 200 years ago, as if that was an answer. <laughs> That's, I love that. <laughs> he never said they were true. Never said they weren't. Just kind of shrugged. It's like, okay, Benjamin, thanks. Right. That feels like Maester history where they're like, we're not going to say people were massacred. We're not going to say who massacred them, but they're gone. Please move forward, everyone. Bran forced himself to look around. The morning was cold, but bright. The sun shining down from a hard blue sky, but he did not like the noises. The wind made a nervous whistling sound as it shivered through the broken towers. The keeps groaned and settled, and he could hear rats scrabbling under the floor of the great hall. The rat cooks children running from their father. The yards were small forests where spindly trees rubbed their bare branches together and dead leaves scuttled like roaches across patches of old snow. There were trees growing where the stables had been and a twisted white werewood pushing up through the gaping hole in the roof of the, do the domed kitchen. Even summer was not at ease here. Bran slipped inside his skin just for an instant to get the smell of the place. He did not like that either. Yeah, so, okay, this is, this is one of the gems of the chapter, this paragraph. Um, so, uh, this now, in the prologue, that way more prologue, one of the things that I love is how George implies the deep sort of secrets of the story through narrative work. So in the prologue, our three um, rangers are plowing through the woods and everything is spooky. Like literally the woods are dead and silent. And in particular, Waymar is almost being attacked by the trees. They're clutching at his cloak. They're almost pulling his sword out of his sheath. His sword's getting tangled. It's, it's basic. it's like the trees are watching them. And then it, it's, it transitions right into the White Walker sighting where Will is up the tree and he sees, he's like, oh, was that a shadow moving through the wood? He's like, no, it was just a tree rustling. He's like, wait, or was it? And then if you look at the uh, descriptions of the White Walkers, like white shadows, pale shadows, weirwood trees are also given those discuss uh, descriptions as well. So Basically, there's a deep secret about the others in the Weirwoods. Check out my others playlist for the, like, the detailed theory about it. But you don't have to understand any of the deep lore to sort of understand that like these others are using the woods as their ally. Like the, the woods are against the Watchmen, and then the others come out of the woods, the shadow of the woods, and they're against the Watchmen too. So if you know anything about elf lore the she mm -hmm. fairy lore, then you're going to catch those vibes right away. Like you're trespassing in the sacred wood. The wood does not want you there. You went too far. And now these freaky ice elves have come out of the shadows and they're going to kill you. So all of that is happening basically through vibes, right? So it, there's more of it here in this chapter. There's lots of trees that seem like they might be living things as in like, dead people or others or something like that. So the yards were small forests where spindly trees rubbed their bare branches together like, an, like a person going like this or something and dead leaves with scuttled like fingers. roaches. Oh, sorry, what'd you say? I said with skeleton fingers. It's not a living hand that's doing that. These are skeleton fingers that are doing this. Yeah, so and the tree, the tree fingers, shout out Radiohead, and the fingers of the others are, and they have all the same wording too. I've gone deep on that in a couple of those videos, but yeah, it's it's very much a lot of the same wording and symbolic parallels. And by the way, all these super chats are going in a dock. They're not just sailing by. I will get them in a second. So just hang tight and thank you. 
Um, so yeah, there's the dead leaves are scuttling like roaches across patches of old snow, like roaches or spiders, even ice spiders. The trees were growing where the stables had been, and a twisted white weirwood pushing up through the gaping hole. So it's like very active language for the trees. It's pushing up through the floor, the taking over the stables. And then even Summer was not at ease here. So all of this tree and leaf activity is very creepy. And it's going to continue, so I just wanted to spotlight it. And everything's dead. So <clears> it's <throat> odd for everything to be described with such life in yes. this place. Yes, that's so thank you. That's that's probably the best way to say it. Everything is dead, and yet it is very animated. Oh. <laughs> uh. Okay, so uh, real quick, uh, just going back here. I'll just use the chat since they are close back. Um, so wait, does uh, Mighty Minarch says, so wait, does that mean the White Walkers can raise the Starks in the Winterfell Crypt if they make it there? Yeah, I'd think so, uh, and possibly sooner. Yeah, possibly sooner. <laughs> Although the Crypt, I would suspect the Winterfell Crypt may have wards on it, much like Blood Raven's Cave. So I would amend that to say that um, the White Walkers, once they cross the wall, can potentially raise the dead in southern Westeros. Um, the the Winterfell crypts may be warded. They've got a lot of dead buried in their lickyard, too, though, so got to keep an eye on those guys. Um, and there's some language in that first chapter when Robert's coming to Winterfell about where are all your people? You know, they're under the snow. Um, there's sort of some double wording that suggests that Ned's people are under the snow. And, of course, the White's sleep under the snow so there's that um benjamin answer is so a temperature what'd you say you think there's a temperature threshold um i know they kind of hinted at that in the show that like you couldn't take a whited body so far south or else it just turned into a skeleton i know they kind of went a little you know living dead on on that but yeah i was uh, i was, I was just think thinking about the point the the white on the chain, uh, attacking Cersei. <laughs> I don't think the, those rules apply, but I'm wondering if, like, if there's a certain, like, if winter has to make it so far and the temperature has to be such, or else the, you know, the others can't can't travel far enough. The whited people can't move as frozen beings. Yeah, I mean, in general, I think they do need to extend the lands of always winter southward. And that is what's going to happen when the long... That's why they need the long night. They can't just bring clouds with them. Like, they need to literally hide the sun so everything gets really cold and dark. They are like vampires. So there is some limits to them in that sense, I think. If there's a temperature threshold, I was asking that because he was asking about the Starks of Winterfell and the fact that the hot springs heat all of Winterfell to the point where, like, it might not be a place that would freeze even if winter came. Like, if oh, it's yeah, I mean, hot springs. that's definitely like the obvious reason why they built Winterfell there for sure. And it does seem like it would be handy against the others just having a warm castle. But you're right, it may actually prevent the, the the whites from from making it down into certain places maybe they can like just crack the walls open and let all that hot water just spew everywhere or something i don't know but uh all right let me uh, let me get this back on track here j lord says benjamin's answer is so serious and very stark like yeah this the starks are very consistently stark like i was making jokes about that when i talked about alaric stark in my script which you'll see in a couple of days D. Divolano, uh, uh, Divolano, sorry, I'm probably saying that wrong, says, uh, thank you for all your great content. Thanks for introducing me. Oh, to Joseph Campbell, yes. That's good stuff. Capital Alpha says, Summer enjoys to sniff brand socks. That is the true other. What? <laughs> <laughs> Little non sequitur today. All right. Personal lawyer. I'm not sure what that's about. Oh, and thank you, by the way, Squishers, using the nice spiders emojis. Appreciate that. Big love to the fam. Has anyone noticed the need for a Stark in Winterfell since Aegon's prophecy? Anyone noted? Um, you know, I think we only hear about the Stark and Winterfell thing from Ned and the modern timeline, so we don't know how far that goes back. But a lot of people have made that comparison to the Aegon's prophecy, which says... There must always be a Targaryen on the throne, essentially, to the idea that there's always got to be a Stark in Winterfell. It does seem like a parallel. 
What'd you say? Uh, I think my car. Yeah, check out the Why Torn Stark Melt video. It's all in there. Um, see, Ramsey Bolton is secretly a white walker. That's why Arya baked the pie. Somebody ate too much weird paste this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to get on your level, man. Thanks for the super chat. I'll just say that. Uh, so picking back up, let's see here. And there was no way through. Bran had told them there wouldn't be. He had told them and told them. But Jojen Reed had insisted on seeing for himself. He had had a green dream, he said, and his green dreams did not lie. Well, they don't open any gates either, thought Bran. The gate the Night Fork guarded had been sealed since the day the Black Brothers had loaded up their mules and garrons and departed for Deep Lake. And, and that's, of course, when Alisan shut it down and, and built Deep Lake. <clears throat> its iron portcullis lowered, the chains that raised it carried off, the tunnel packed with stone and rubble, all frozen together until they were Im as impenetrable as the wall itself. We should have followed John, Bran said when he saw it. He thought of his bastard brother often since the night that Summer had watched him ride off through the storm. We should have found the King's Road and gone to Castle Black. We dare not, my prince, Jojen said. I've told you why. But there are wildlings. They killed some men, and they wanted to kill John, too. Jojen, there were hundreds of them. So you said, we are four. You helped your brother, if that was him in truth. But it almost cost you Summer. I know, Bran said miserably. <clears throat> Excuse me. The direwolf had killed three of them, maybe more, but there had been too many. When they formed a tight ring around the tall, earless man, he had tried to slip away through the rain, but one of their arrows had come flashing after him, and the sudden stab of pain had driven Bran right out of the wolf's skin and back into his own. That's an interesting point right there, Talk, that pain can drive a skin changer out of their animal. Um, and I suggested this might be it might make it hard for somebody to skin change a dragon because the uh, the dragon is um, fire made flesh. It may feel like touching a burning stove or something like that. Do you remember when uh, we get the skin changer manual and the, is it intro to Dance with Dragons? Um, when Thistle uses self-inflicted pain almost to keep uh, him out of her like by biting her tongue off or whatever she was doing it seemed like she was doing it for the purpose like as you're reading it it seems like she's doing it so that she can't speak spells or something once she's skin changed or something to do with her ability to speak but seeing this and knowing that skin changers can be driven out by pain i'm wondering if she might have been trying to keep him from hopping inside of her by being under such duress whenever he was trying or something like that you know i didn't think about that uh, but that actually does make sense um, I it's see I just read it all as she's going mad, she's clawing at her face and biting her tongue, you know, weird stigmata. Um, but yeah, no, you're right. She might have been actually trying to do that. Um, that's interesting. That's hardcore. If so, it's just what I thought. Yeah, right. She was. I mean, do you think she knew much about? She had observed him. And I think so. Him, yeah, him. I think the wildlings all kind of know what's up with skin changers. They seem to. That was the vibe that I got. But uh, did Oral get pushed out too by through pain or fire? Fire. Or yeah, Melisandre burned the eagle and Oriel got bounced right out of there. That's right. No, it wasn't a dumb question, Adrienne. I've got it right here. Um, the super chat was, if the others are an endangered species, shout out George Clinton, could they have conceivably built the wall? to protect themselves, to keep people away. Yes, absolutely. That's one of the oldest theories about the wall is that everyone has it backwards and that the others built the wall to keep the people out of the north um, and that they're trying to chase the wildlings out or maybe the wildlings are the people they kept on their side of the wall to farm because we know they need babies, right? So they kept the wildlings on their side to farm them for baby sacrifices and everyone else they want to keep out. Absol that's, that's a total theory. Um, yeah, I, I think the, I support that because I think the, the main things we've seen that the wall magic prevents from passing are like fire magic beings and non night's watch, like people who haven't sworn the oath of the night's watch, which the night's watch itself, like 
because the history can be all muddled. The nature of the Night's Watch seems more like a post on the wall than it does anything else. So if you're just describing it as a post on the wall and the only people that are allowed to go north or pass through the gate are people who have sworn the oath of the watch and the people that are prevented are everyone else and fire magic, it seems like the people who set the wall or set the spells didn't like fire magic and didn't like anyone except for the Night's Watch. And that would be the agreement, like dynamics of uh, like the, the people of the North, the others, uh, the wildlings rather. And uh, I was trying to think of the name of the, like the Starks and the uh, King Beyond the Wall group. Yeah, the wildlings, uh, that agreement. Oh, you got muted. I was just agreeing with you. I was saying it is it is good to step back and think about things practically like that. Like, what's actually happening here? Who's allowed to pass? Who's welcome? Who's not welcome? Yeah, like I said, it, it could be that the others are more in control of this entire situation. It could be that they built the wall. It could be that that whole black gate thing is so the night's watch can bring them babies sometimes it could be that they're farming the wildlings yes all of this could be true um and i'm in favor that the others are going to turn out to be just in all ways more conscious and intentionally acting than uh than we think so or that the night's think. queen up there tempting you know the night's king the corpse queen up there she was the one running around that tempted him so I don't think she'd be as tempting if she was just like frozen or laying on the ground somewhere. They have to have some type of some action or autonomy on their own that intrigued him or that he was interacting with. <clears throat> well, I've, yeah, I've, <laughs> just biting my tongue here. I've got so many theories, man. You know, Night's Queen, my main theory about Night's Queen is that, first of all, her real name is Corpse Queen. So some people have like, oh, she's a white but she doesn't sound like a white. She's described as beautiful and Night's King falls in love with her and this and that. So I think she's corpse queen because she raises corpses, not because she's a corpse. So what I think that Night's Queen is, is the cold Melisandre, a priestess that's been using ice magic for so long, they've transformed their physiology just as Melisandre is transforming her physiology. And I think she, this is the, the origin of the others. Because someone's got to be icy first. And I feel like if Night's Queen is an ice priestess, then she can give birth to babies that are magical babies or something like that. So that's all got to get started somehow. I, I, I do think Night's Queen is more important than Night's King, in a sense. And well, I think Go ahead. What you just said, dude. The, the story says that he saw her running around up there. He was intrigued. He had no fear. So he chased after her. He got her. He laid with her and she was ice cold. He gave a seed in his soul and then came back with magic that he didn't have before and cast all of his brothers under a spell. So it's like that. She's clearly the sorceress that had all the power. So he wasn't doing any of that before he went up there and slept with her and died. So that's exactly what I picture. Exactly. That's it. Yeah. Like she transformed him or led him to magic, showed him how to use magic. Yeah. That's what it seems like to me. Yep. So uh, we'll get, we'll get back to that more, but um, uh, let's see. Hal Rager says, deep love. Got to go. Thanks buddy. J Lord again. I don't think the others want all men dead. Um, all the whites we've seen have been wildlings and night's watchmen. Maybe they don't just want humans north of the wall. So it's possible, like I said, that they're trying to chase the wildlings across the wall and that they'll try to kill anyone. But the wildlings have been living north of the wall for 8,000 years. So I think it's more likely that they're farming them. But we'll see. Um, let's see here. All these theories are valid by the way. So that's that's the fun part about this. Um, Ross, Tembi, and I don't think, um, Jay Lord, I think you're right in that, like, I don't know if the others just want to kill everyone. They might want to terraform the world. 
that's maybe a better way to think about it, like just to make it habitable for them, which means not for anyone else, unfortunately. And I don't, I don't think they, like they talk about the, like the lone night was the thing that really spread across the land. They describe and kind of talk about it almost like it's an invasion, but they don't, like no one ever describes them coming out of the north to annihilate everyone. They describe the night and the cold being the thing that you should be afraid of. And they just exist in, and the cold and the night was all pushed beyond the wall. So, it, you know, they might not be as destructive. They just exist in this really destructive environment. Yeah, well, the, the question is, you know, why are they raising the dead? That's kind of the destructive thing that they're doing is, is raising the dead and sending them against the living. So, um, but yeah, it, like, I, like you're saying, it's, it may just be a simple fact of their existence that they're not just not copacetic with, you know, warm-blooded life. And that's that. Can I play Others, other, others Advocate? <laughs> sure, sure. They're, they're giving death life. You know, they would value their type of life more than life life. Oh, so they're raising them okay. in their own existence. I thought you would like being an undead white. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a new angle, but you're right. You're right. I mean, yeah, that's different. Different creatures that are so different from each other will relate and think about things differently like that. So, yeah, that's, that's not a yeah. bad point. Ross Temby says, in what way is the wall a hinge of the world in Mel's chapter? Uh, yeah, it was Mel's chapter. A hinge of the world basically means it's like a magical hotspot. We don't know if it's a naturally occurring thing or if it's something that's accrued because so much magic has been used there. But one way or the other, there is some, it's like, think about like ley lines or something like that. You know, this is sort of an old occult idea. But you'd think that like a shy by the shadow is probably a hinge of the world. Because Mel compares the wall to a shy and says, ah, my magic will be even stronger here than it is at a shy. So a hinge of the, war of the world is a place where magic works more potently. We don't know, again, if that's natural or if that's accumulated over time. But that's essentially what it means. Thoughts? Like the and... Yeah, like yeah. The, the, the volcanoes of Illyria, for sure, yeah. Dragonstone, even. It, it almost seems like elemental hotspots, because of the nature of magic in this world, are the places that would be the hinges of the world. Like the mountains and the different places where, like maybe even in an ocean, where underwater volcanoes are meeting water. And, you know, those seem like the type of places that he would view as being magically powerful. And then the other thing, like you were saying, David, would be places where they've done a lot of magic, where it's maybe polluted the land with power or corrupted power or whatever, like a shy. Uh, yeah, it's one or the other. And essentially what it amounts to is, oh, you got a weird thing on your screen. What happened? Up oh, there you go. Oh, the video just for a second. Uh -huh. The glitch in the matrix. This isn't a simulation, though. This is a real live stream. So, um, yeah, I, I I think that is the bottom line is that it amplifies magic and that people are going to be able to use that. Like Melisandre is already like sort of going like this, thinking about using the hinge of the world as an amplifier. So it's definitely something you got to pay attention to. Now, I'll... I, <laughs> I'm I'm saving saving some stuff for when we actually get to the Black Gate, but of course, there You're is right. a giant weirwood organism at the Night Fort. We've already seen there's a weirwood tree that's just growing up through the floor in the kitchen, and then right next to that weirwood tree is a well. And when you go down the well, quite a ways, by the way, it's way down there. Um, then you find a secret passage, and then there's the weirwood face down there. So. Clearly, in my opinion, the tree in the kitchen is growing from the organism that's underground. These things are very strongly suggested as mushrooms. So the weirwood trees are essentially just like the caps that are popping up above the ground. We, we know that the weirwood roots go hundreds and hundreds of feet down. We've seen that at Blood Raven's Cave. So essentially, in what I'm suggesting, Carter, and I'll turn this over to you for comments, 
is that Sorry. that weirwood organism is undoubtedly the oldest thing here. It would predate the night fort itself. It predates the wall. Weirwood trees are eternal. They don't die. So what I'm saying is that the original hinge of the world, the original magic that was here is probably tied to this weirwood organism. That is That would be why they built the night fort around it. And possibly why they built the wall here uh, connecting to the night fort. Because the night fort is the oldest castle on the wall and it might even predate the wall. Because if you think about it, you'd need a castle, you'd need a base of operations to do a great civics work project like build the wall. So that's my theory on the night fort is that it was the weirwood organism first and that's why people built the castle there and then built the wall there. Your thoughts? Uh, uh, you were talking about the symbolism of the weirwoods always being a mushroom. Uh, symbolically, just through their color scheme even. But in this one, it, I don't know how many other ones we get where the weirwood is growing into a room with a dome ceiling like that. Like the kitchen has a dome ceiling, so it literally even has like a physical cap on it, like a little mushroom dome cap. Very um, clever, very clever. I was thinking mostly dome of the sky because there's a lot of astronomy symbolism that's going to happen, but you're right. There's, it also works that way as well. But I think that you're right on with the, like it being the original gate and it being built around the magical power of the werewoods. And if not the werewoods, cause this seems like a, a ghost, uh, fort and the tree, the werewoods are like ghost versions of the old, like I always thought of them as like ghost versions of the old heart trees that were like they're, you know, we had talked about them being kind of like a, a worshiping place for uh, the people who worshiped with Garth Greenhand. And when you could, you know, you could green see they were worshiping the trees, but they were living trees back then. It didn't seem like the, the worship in the old God sense was of werewoods. It seemed more like it was just of trees, of green trees, of heart trees. And the fort could have been built around, you know, a green tree or a Garth tree or something where that was like a, a Northern location for, for green seeing. And, you know, they had that power there. Cause I always thought that the wall seemed and the magic to create the wall seemed more closely related to hammer the waters uh, magic or water magic than it ever did to like fire magic or like stone shaping magic. Like that seemed, that all seemed fire magic and the wall felt more like a giant wave that was frozen in place. Kind of like when they would slam water and ruin our magic by those those theories are out there too. Um, it it almost seems like a the front half of a the front end of a glacier that's been chopped um, as well, and it's compared to a river and a stream. The only thing about that is like water magic isn't a big enough part of the story to me for that to be the explanation for the building of the wall. Like, oh, it was the squishers. It's not going to be <laughs> satisfactory for uh, for most people. I mean, right? You know. Uh, it'd be funny, but like that's like, that's probably not how the wall was built by raising water and then freezing it in place. Well, if you th so you're thinking of the the wall and the impetus of their fight being to fight off the Andals versus like the first men, because everything seemed like it was targeted more at the Andals than it was necessarily at the first men. Like the first men go north of the wall. The first men are the ones that have the agreement to like give the kids to the others and stuff like that. And I, if I remember it was the, the children were trying to annihilate the Andals when they were using like their largest magic destruction. Yeah, no, I, I get what you're saying. Like the scale of the magic of raising the wall, the only thing you could compare it to probably is the hammer of the waters. Um, of course, the hammer of the waters, that's Carter, that we're going to lose another hour of, of theory time if you get me started on that. Um, but even if even if you go with my theory that the hammer itself was a moon meteor, 
we still go back to like Azor High somehow crashing a comet into the moon or something, calling down the meteors. There is definitely some deep magic in this story that allows people or elves or green men to mess with the most primal powers of the of the planet and the universe. And we've also seen to you know to the to what you were saying earlier that magic does come from the elements. You know, volcanoes, any strong force of nature is going to be seemingly a source of magic. So maybe there was a river ac across the north there that got frozen. Maybe that is part of the ingredient. Um you know, I just like I said, I I don't I can't really picture water mages. But if there was, like I said, a river or something that was frozen at the foundation, that, that could make sense to me. They're in Dorne. What are you talking They're underground in Dorne, <laughs> led by the toad. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, like I said, I love Dorne, but... <laughs> uh, so I got a few more questions here. Let me, let me grab these real quick. Uh, thanks for all the Super Chats today, by the way. Uh, let's see here. In what way is the wall a hinge of the... Oh, I just read that. Sorry. Um, I was wondering about the use of the word hinge, Ross says. Yeah, that's the one I was looking for. Hinge implies movement, opening, closing, swinging. So yes, um, the major thing about the hinge, and there's a whole line of symbolism about the screaming hinge, is it's basically opening the door of death, the, the door to the other side. The, um, the wall represents the veil of tears the veil between the live the realm of the living and the realm of the dead with obviously north of the wall representing the realm of the dead so if you open that hinge it means that dead things are coming into the land of the living which is exactly what's going to happen if the wall cracks so that's a that's one way in which it's a door that opens and then also you know de melisandre is saying oh well my spells will be more powerful so it's also a doorway to magic, to just simply strong magical power that you can harness. I mean, the hinge is also, like you said, a thing on which, like, that's what creates the motion. Like, that's the mechanism that allows you to do the door opening and door closing. So, like, the hinge is the thing that allows you to do the magic or to do right, like a fulcrum. Doing. Yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good clarification. So that makes us think of Melisandre using the wall as a fulcrum to then do something. Um, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So we'll have to we'll have to keep our eye on what goes on there at the wall. All right. So jumping Portal's back importance. into the chapter. Oh, sorry. What did you say? Portals importance, I believe. Wasn't that the signs and signs and portals? Signs yep. and portals. Okay. That's the that's the jam. That's the jam. And also Nissa Nissa's scream is part of the screaming hinge symbolism. So when she screams, it cracks the moon. That opens the floodgates to the long night, the moon meteors, Lightbringer is born, all kinds of things happen. So that's part of that too. But let's, uh, let's stick to the script here and just theories about the others before I get into bizarre cool. Nissa Nissa wordplay stuff. It says, uh, Bran had reached out for summer time and time again, but the pain he found drove him back. The way a red-hot kettle makes you pull your hand back, even when you mean to grab it. Only Hodor slept that night, muttering, Hodor, Hodor, as he tossed and turned. Bran was terrified that summer was off dying in the darkness. Please, you old gods, he prayed. You took Winterfell, and my father, and my legs. Please don't take summer, too. And watch over Jon Snow, and make the wildlings go away. Just taking things off the list there <clears throat> so it said um no weirwoods grew on that stony island in the lake and they're talking about um queen's crown now yet somehow the old gods must have heard the wildlings took their sweet time about departing the next morning stripping the bodies of the dead and the old man they'd killed even pulling a few fish from the lake and there was a scary moment when three of them found the causeway and started to walk out but the path turned and they didn't and two of them nearly drowned before the others pulled them out. The tall, bald man yelled at them, his words echoing across the water in some tongue that even Jojen did not know, which would be the old tongue. And a little while later, they gathered up their shields and spears and marched off north by east, the same way John had gone. Bran wanted to leave too and look for summer, but the reeds said no. We stay another night, said Jojen. 
Put some leagues between us and the wildlings. You don't want to meet them again, do you? Later that afternoon, Summer returned from wherever he'd been hiding, dragging his back leg. He ate parts of the bodies in the inn, driving off the crows, then swam out to the island. Mira had drawn the broken arrow from his leg and rubbed the wound with the juice of some plants she found growing around the base of the tower. The dire wolf was still limping, but a little less each day, it seemed to Bran. The gods had heard. You want to pick it up there with maybe we should try another castle? Yeah. <clears throat> maybe we should try another castle, Mira said to her brother. Maybe we could get through the gate somewhere else. I could go scout if you wanted. I'd make better time by myself. Bran shook his head. If you go east, there's Deep Lake. Then Queen's Gate. West is Ice Mark. But they'll be the same, only smaller. All the gates are sealed except the ones at Castle Black, East Watch, and the Shadow Tower. Hodor said, Hodor, to that. And the Reeds exchanged a look. At least I should climb to the top of the wall, Mira decided. Maybe I'll see something up there. What could you hope to see, Jojen asked. Something, said Mira. And for once, she was adamant. It should be me. Bran raised his head to look up at the wall and imagined himself climbing inch by inch, scrumming his fingers into cracks in the ice and kicking footholds with his toes. Yeah. That made him smile in spite of everything. Mr. Sol. I've done everything up to Ross, I think. Sorry. So means, I thought I was muted. I was doing a little a super chat behind the scenes communication here just to keep it tabs. Yeah, so just let me pause you right here. So Bran is watching Mira climb, essentially, and he's very human moment, remembering when he used to climb all the time. And so it's, you know, it's one of those moments when Bran is feeling the loss of his legs very keenly, right? Mm -hmm. Now, some of the language here is interesting, though. Um, the wall looks like stone, but then the, the, uh, the clouds would break and the sun would hit it and all at once it would transform and stand there white and blue and glittering. It was the end of the world, old Nan always said. So that's, like I said, they're always talking about it being the end of the world. And on the other side were monsters and giants and ghouls, but they could not pass so long as the wall stood strong. I want to stand on top with Mira, Bran thought. I want to stand on top and see. So again, we've... You know, this like we're talking about. The wall is the thing that keeps the monsters out, that keeps winter out. Now, maybe maybe the humans are the monsters and the others built the wall, like we said, but uh, that's the that's what that's how they think about the wall. Yeah. They don't say what they're defending the realms of men against necessarily. They're just defending the realms of men. Let's see here. Um uh, here's a on topic super chat. Eric says, I think that the wall might be something that was not, uh, not something that was built, but something that was enchanted to remain part of an ice sheet from a time of the long night, which may, uh, be like a last ice age. Like I said, it does look like the front half of a glacier. I just, I'm, I have trouble coming up with the mechanism for how you cut off the back half of the glacier. Um, and where did all that water go? But it does look like that. I will give you that. I, I still think it's uh, it's what it looks like when a giant wave hits a wall of ice magic. You get an ice wall. That would be something. If Bran sees that in a vision, that'll be something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, J. Lord, a little off topic here. Let me see if I can take this. I think that Brandon Stark is a lot like Leto Atreides the second. Leto, spoiler alert, became a, a worm and ruled for, th for thousands of years. Yeah, he did. I think God King Brandon will do the same and become a giant talking tree God King. So I think the opposite J-Lord, but there's only theories, so that's, the, you know, my idea is as good as yours. I think that Bran is going to be the last green seer, that he'll lose his connection to the Weirwoods, and that he'll download all of the hive mind into his head so it's not in the trees. Um... And he'll be, he'll be very human, essentially, but he'll have all that knowledge in his head. So they'll have to write it all down before he dies, essentially. But maybe, 
Maybe he'll be the king of the God's eye and he'll just be like a tree. That would be cool too. I mean, I'd, I would take that. Or it's uh, like a, you get some time travel. He becomes the, the old face in the wall. For yeah, I mean, George said, um, well, D&D said that George said that he would be the final king at the end. So maybe he means like at the end of time, you know, just as a giant tree. Yeah, uh, oh, uh, I can't think of the fountain. He's just traveling through space in a bubble with the tree. Oh, I haven't like seen that. From the fountain. Uh, You've never no. saw the fountain. Did oh, yes, I have. Yes, I have. Long time ago. I remember that now. Yeah. It goes on your other channel, but. That would be on channel. my other channel. Yeah, I should rewatch that <laughs> one. That was like, I, I can't remember if it was like really deep or if it was just playing with sacred symbolism to make a movie but I have, to, I have to it's been a long time since i've seen it i vote deep i watched it uh in some definite uh epic altered states and it it, it uh it spoke to some things and if you know anything about like mythology and uh just the way that uh like those themes can echo through time like it has a lot of the stuff that you like with some of those other series like dark where you you can see those themes echoing through history and they bring one story together through multiple timelines um yeah i could i could uh like i said it all gets down to like what george is doing with bran and all that green seer shit so we'll just have to see it's fun to speculate uh but I'm waiting for the... I think the next book is going to give us more clues about where Bran's story is going. So I think we'll have a lot of new Bran theories after Winds of Winter comes out. Kelly Johnson says, David Lightbringer fears Azor Ahai's flaming sword of justice. I'm not sure what that means. What have you done? I don't know. I'm, I sleep well at night. I don't know. I'm not afraid of much of anything. So Certainly not justice. But maybe there's a joke there I don't get. Explain yourself, Kelly. I'm, I feel like uh, something's going over my head here. Whew, there it went. So let's see here. Um, let me see where we need to pick up reading again. That made him smile in, in spite of everything. No, nah, I, I, might, I might skip ahead a little bit. Okay. Maester Lewin saying the Night Fort was the only castle where the steps have been cut from the ice of the wall itself. That sounds really treacherous. Ice steps that have been haven't been maintained in two hundred years. They're like barely bumps. Yeah, that's what it says. The steps must have melted and refrozen a thousand times, and every time they did, they shrunk a little and got smoother and rounder and more treacherous and smaller. It's almost like the wall was swallowing them back into itself. Mira Reed was very sure footed, but even so, she was going slowly, moving from nub to nub. And a couple places she got down on all fours. It will be worse when she comes down. Good lord. Yeah, I would. This is making me terrified. I want to skip ahead. Um, <laughs> just like the veil, like describing the donkey ride on the veil was terrifying in the book. Mm, yes, it was. And that's and that's a good comparison actually for symbolism. As a matter of fact, let's see here. Um, when will she come down? Bran asked Jojen. When she's ready, she'll want to have a good look at the wall and what's beyond. We should do the same down here. Hodor? Hodor said doubtfully. We might find something, Jojen insisted. Or something might find us. Bran couldn't say it, though. He did not want Jojen to think he was craven. So go ahead and pick it up with So They Kept Exploring. So they went exploring. Jojen Reed leading. Bran in his basket on Hodor's back. Summer padding by their side. Once the dire wolf bolted through a dark door and returned a moment later with a gray rat between his teeth. The rat cook, Bran thought, but it was the wrong color and only as big as a cat. The rat cook was white and almost as huge as a sow. There were a lot of dark doors in the night fort and a lot of rats. Bran could hear them scurrying through the vaults and cellars in the maze of pitch black tunnels that connected them. Jojen wanted to go poking around down there but Hodor said, Hodor, to that. And Bran said, no. There were worse things than rats down in the dark beneath the night fort. So real quick, 
this is a callback to a to um the scene where Rob and John scared all the Stark kids in the Winterfell crypts. Um, Rob is leading the kids down, and he says there are worse things down here than rats. And that's when John jumps out, covered in white flour, pretending to be an other or a ghost. So that's what Bran is talking about when he says there are worse things down here than rats. You know, real monsters. So and this seems an probably... old place. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. And probably describing the white cook because he characterizes him as being white, and be, and he would be a monster in the night fort. The rat cook is a monster of, of men, you know. Yeah, I think the rat cook is mainly a weirwood reference because it's a huge white rat with red eyes, and it's condemned to eat its young. So I think this has to do with like sacrificing babies to the weirwoods, or the fact that all the green seers are uh, um, absorbed into the hive mind when they die. So the, the weirwood tree is essentially eating all of its descendants. That's what I think the, the that is about. Are you having some technical? Yes. Yes, he is. We'll just wait for talk to get his shit working again here real quick. So uh, there were a lot of dark doors in the night forts and a lot of rats. Um, oh, I just read that. Sorry. Uh, there are worse things down here than rats. Okay, so this seems an old place, Jojen said, as they walked down a gallery where the sunlight fell in dusty shafts through empty windows. Twice as old as Castle Black, Bran said, remembering. It was the first castle on the wall and the largest. And this is the big clue. Um, talk. Are you with me again? Cool. So the fact that it's the largest castle as well as the oldest I suspect this castle, again, was built around the weirwood organism before the wall was built, and that it may well have just been a lord's castle before it became um, a castle used by the Watch. Because why is it so friggin' big? You know? Like, you'd expect the oldest castle on the Night's Watch to be, like, kind of primitive, like a little ring fort or something. But it's this giant thing. Oh, I can't hear you. Your mic's not coming through. I'll let you know when it does. Keep trying. But yes, this is, um, I think, like I said, I think that's a major clue. The fact that it's so big and it's the oldest one. Yeah, I, th I think it was before the wall. Exactly right. I think it was belonged to some king of the first men. Maybe King Sherrit. No, not King Sherrit. Would have been older than that. But yeah, before the wall. Um, so picking up, uh, let's see here. Uh, it had also been the first abandoned all the way back in the time of the old king, and that's Jaehaerys, even though it had been three quarters empty and too costly to maintain. Um, e oh, sorry, even then it had been three quarters empty and too costly to maintain. Good Queen Alysanne had suggested that the watch replace it with a smaller, newer castle at a spot only seven miles east where the wall curved along the shore of a beautiful green lake. Deep Lake had been paid for by the Queen's jewels and built by the men the old king had sent north, and the Black Brothers had abandoned the night fort to the rats. That was two centuries past, though. Deep Lake now stood as empty as the castle it had replaced, and the night fort. There are ghosts here, Bran said. Are you back? Hello, can you hear yes. me? Yes, talk is back. All right. What are your thoughts on the night fort pre predating the wall? Sound like you were trying I, to say something there. Yeah, I agree. I, it kind of goes to what we were talking about with the the ring forts and the design and what's contained in the night fort. Because uh, I don't know. I'm sure some of the people in the chat and you also listen to uh, Robert's stuff and his uh, his walkthroughs of the different locations. And the night fort was one that sounded so much like Winterfell and a lot of the first men uh, holdfasts and stuff, just based on the things that were inside of it. It didn't have all of the excesses that a lot of the later uh, houses would have. It seemed like it just had the basics, like a. it even had the dome. You know, the dome is something that seems like we see in that rounded shape more in first men locations than in some of the later houses. So, uh, I think 
the design of it and like we were saying, having that, uh, having the tree in the center of it is another thing that suggests it's one of the older houses or one of the first ones that still like, worships the, the trees. That's really interesting. Um, yeah. Are there any other octagons anywhere? Octagonal buildings? Mm. I can't think of any. Um, none that come to mind. And I guess it's just the kitchens that are octagonal, but that is interesting. Um, yeah, it does definitely sound to me, again, like like an old first man castle, not a ring fort, but something built by the mighty the mighty men of the first men. Because there were a few, you know, we do have tales like Castle Pike is super old, obviously predates whatever earthquake collapsed a lot of the land out there. Uh, Storm's End, it's a little bit murky, but supposedly built before the Andals. Um, and there are some others as well. Well, obviously, Moat Kalen. Moat Kalen is basically mm -hmm. a megalithic construction that's either built by the first men or by, like, by the friggin' squishers or something. So, Remodeled yeah. by the squishers. What's that? Remodeled by the squishers. Remodeled by the squishers. They really did a lot. Um. See, not isolated on the God's eye. That will be the seat of the immortal God King of the world. I'm talking about a literal immortal God King of Westeros. Um, I don't know what you mean, Jay Lord. I thought we were talking about Bran becoming a tree and living forever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we're just all speculating here anyway. Um, Azor High will save Westeros like the Jon Snow spinoff, Kelly says. Um... Well, I'm glad you're optimistic for the Jon Snow show. I, I'm less so, but we'll we'll see. It's <laughs> a lot of Kit. Is it is it going to be Kit again? That's a it's a Kit heavy series. Yeah, well, it was Kit's idea. He's the one that brainstormed the thing. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, Eric points out that the glacier wouldn't need to be cut. Uh, they just need to enchant a stripe of it and then let the rest of it melt. So, maybe I mean. However the wall was built, it's going to be something unreal and fantastical. There's no, like, low-key way to build a 700-foot wall of ice, you know, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, you were so, looking for a water source. We do have a water source on that, too, that we'll get to talk about here in a minute. Up by the wall, a pretty intense water source. But it probably wouldn't freeze based on the nature of that water source. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, well, I guess I guess bring that up when it when it's um when it comes up. So there are ghosts here. Bran said Hodor had heard all of these stories before, but Jojen might not have. Old ghosts from before the old king, and this is Bran talking. Even before Aegon the Dragon, seventy nine deserters who went south to be outlaws. One was Lord Riswell's youngest son. So when they reached the Barrowlands, they sought shelter at his castle. But Lord Riswell took them captive and returned them to the night fort. The Lord Commander had holes hewn in the top of the wall, and he put the deserters in them and sealed them up alive in the ice. And this is heavy symbolism here. They have spears and horns, and they all face north. The 79 sentinels, they're called. They left their posts in life, so in death their watch goes on forever. Years later, when Lord Riswell was old and dying, he had himself carried to the night fort, so he could take the black and stand beside his son. He'd sent him back to the wall for honor's sake, but he loved him still, so he came to share his watch. So that means there's 80 sentinels now. Um, but yeah, so think about this. Night's Watchman, frozen alive in the ice, and they each have spears and horns. So they hold the spear like, like, a, tree like a tree trunk, and they have horns. And you can think of, you know, horns that you blow, but also think of horns like green men here. And there's always green man symbolism with the Night's Watchmen and the others. But basically, if you look at the symbols here, these are Night's Watchmen that have been frozen and transformed. And that's implying that the others might in some sense be frozen and transformed Night's Watchmen, or that the Night's Watch and the others might share a common green man origin or something like that. So... What do you make of the 79 Sentinels as is uh, 
Because it's obviously a symbolism to, I mean, all those details. That's not, I mean, it's a fun little story, but. Yeah, the story just, bumped, I mean, as Risewell, as the Lord thinking, like, as if I was his son, I don't think it would be any consolation to me that he still loved me. He sent me up there to be frozen on a wall, you know. Lord Risewell's like, no, no, no. I mean, I still loved him. I went back, I, went, I got frozen myself. I don't think that'd be any consolation to his son. I think he'd still be pretty upset about it. I, I do think it's a very George kind of story. You know, that's the way he talks about family love and honor and duty and stuff like that. Like sometimes it really hurts to love your family and to do an honorable thing, but you do it anyway. So Lord Riswell sent his son back to the wall. That wasn't easy. Uh, but then he came back and was buried alongside of him to show his love. So it's, it's the complex kind of stuff that George likes to chew on for sure. Um, but yeah, I, this I said that just to say, if I was going to kill my son, send him up there to freeze him in a wall, I would need a pretty good reason. And I would think if I was on the Night's Watch, you know, if one person's running away, that's one thing Maybe he's craving. If 79 of them run away, like something happened that made all of them abandon their watch is the way that I was picking up on it. Mm. Like something had to have been an impetus for like a third of the people on the wall to just like take off towards yeah. the gift. You're right. Every other like, Night's Watch rebellion that we've had has some sort of reason. You know, uh, it was a bunch of warrior sons who were never loyal to the Targs to begin with for one time. Or in John's case, he was letting the wildlings through the wall. You know, there's... So yeah, you're right. Something must have happened. And whatever it was, the people running the wall at the time were... wanted them back. Like, they weren't also shaken by whatever happened at the wall you know they they demanded them come back and be executed i don't know if it was a war but it seemed like they were running from something that maybe the people that stayed at the wall weren't scared of what was that last thing you said maybe what it seemed it seemed like they were running the people the 79 sent, sentinels that ran and abandoned their post seemed like they were running from something that the people on the wall who stayed weren't afraid of because you know, they stayed and then put them in the wall, which is something that had never happened before when they came back. Yeah, I mean, it just sounds like harsh justice to me. I don't know if they were, maybe they were afraid of something. It's just hard to say. I mean, all we can do is speculate. They, they could have just been making a break for it. Um, maybe there was something, even the Lord Commander was unjust. I mean, it was, maybe he was a cruel Lord Commander. He did bury them alive in ice after all, it's, so... Maybe that maybe that's the answer. But um, Carl Karsnark is chiming in with the main thing that I was leaving out. Sentinels are trees that, that are very common in A Song of Ice and Fire. George uses the sentinel trees all the time. And he's using those to tell us that the others are like trees. The sentinel trees are frequently wearing cloaks of snow and ice and are described as if they were others. So here we've got the sentinels... They're buried in the ice. They're buried alive. So they're in death. Their watch goes on forever. So think about the fact that Night's King ensorcelled his brothers on the watch. So like Night's King was also creating others with Night's Queen. So that might all be part of the same story. You know, there might be a sense in which the original others were supposed to be Night's Watchmen or are kind of alt to the Night's Watch. So we have these frozen Night's Watchmen. They're like sent they're like frozen trees, and their watch goes on forever. So it's pretty cool there. You like I said, you can splice it a couple different ways, but I definitely think that's talking about the others as both frozen trees and as having a very close relationship to the watch. And I was just reading a little bit more about that single tree. They're giant trees they're giant sequoias they're a giant species oh that's uh, cool that's awesome i don't know if it has any significance but it seems giants always seem like the magical beings in the north like they almost the equivalent of like a dragon in you know in a lot of myths they kind of make those as being like the ice beings yeah the weirwoods have a lot of giant symbolism uh the winterfell heart tree is called a pale giant frozen in time 
So that's an okay. interesting so one. Right. Like, so that's, that's what we're talking about here. These 79 sentinels, you know, they're giants in the sense that the sentinel trees are giants and they're literally frozen in time. And that's who the others are. The others are frozen in time. They are timeless. Um, and they want to kill time, if you think about it. The long night is a breaking of the day-night cycle and the cycle of the seasons. So it effectively stops time. And I've talked about this a lot in Signs and Portals, uh, which is a podcast series you can find on my YouTube channel. But basically, yes, you know, movement is life. And the others are a, are a still kind of death. They're quiet and they're still and they essentially want to freeze everything. <clears throat> and even going further, the wall itself um, has river of time symbolism, um, as do the weirwoods, right? The weirwoods, uh, Blood Raven says that, you know, the weirwoods, uh, time is like a river, but the weirwood tree is not moved by that river. So it's standing outside the river of time. Then the wall itself mm -hmm. is described as a river and it is frozen. So it's kind of telling you like the others, they want to freeze the river of time. They want to stop the cycle of the seasons. They want to shut down all processes of living, you know, of a biological life, essentially. And that the weirwood at the, the Black Gate really does function as a weir if you're talking about the wall being the river. Yes. Like it really is the filter. And that's the point, yes. Yeah. So the Winterfell yeah. weirwood is a pale giant frozen in time yeah, there's just a lot of layers. It's that's it it gets into like word salad when I'm trying to write essays about this stuff. And this is like this, which is like this, which is like this, and it's like a circle. But that I feel like that weirwood is the most physical uh weir like like I'm talking like fishing weir. Like that's the most fishing weir like weirwood that we see. Like it's the one that's the most like a filter physically between one part of the world and another. Like we don't see another weirwood that really functions as that much of a physical portal. Are you talking about the Black Gate? The Black Gate, sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And just so in case you're not hip to it, um, weir is, um, it's not, it's a word that's not used in America as much, but in Britain or Australia, they still use the word a lot. And basically a weir is a kind of dam. Um, there's, there's different types of weirs, but it can be a dam. It can also be a sort of, mesh like uh like a sluice gate almost um they can be used for fishing and it's usually called a fishing weir when it's for that but a fishing weir is like a wooden mesh work it's kind of like a bridge mm -hmm. and the, it, it catches the bigger fish it strains them out of the river so when george says that the weirwoods stand astride the river of time but are not moved he's actually describing a weir which is a, a wooden bridge thing that strides a river and isn't moved. But it strains the river, it also regulates the flow, and it pulls the fish out. So the green seers, in this analogy, would be the fish, because the weirwoods are plucking the green seers out of the river of time so that they're not trapped by its flow, and they become eternal with the weirwood. So the green seers are like fish, and the green, here's the joke, the green seers swim in a green sea. Okay, that's mm -hmm. that's the river of time that the weirwoods regulate and stride. It's like a green sea. So there's all this aquatic symbolism that comes into it. I don't want to get too lost here, but yes, the the black gate weirwood organism is literally striding this frozen river. So pretty cool stuff. Watch, check out Did signs and make, portals if you want the more coherent explanation of all that stuff, basically. Did you have anything for the 70, the number 79? I know usually you have a lot I of do symbolism, not. but I've never heard 79 used for symbolism much. Yeah, 69, we could have done something with. Um, yep, that's hot, but 79, not so much. Yeah, if anybody knows what that is, then let me know. Um, you know, there's... Seven is an interesting number. It's the number of the King's Guard. There's six others, and then Waymar to make a seventh, um, or six others, and they're looking for John to make a seventh. And then the nine makes you think of the Weirwood Grove of nine, but 
I'm totally grasping at straws there. I, I don't know why it's 79. Because it rhymes with time, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Minty. Minty got one in there. All right, all right. So will you pick it up with they spent half the day poking through the castle? Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was looking. I'm sure Carl will be looking up 79 symbolism, but uh, I was just trying to pull that up real quick. They spent half the day poking through the castle. Some of the towers had fallen down and others looked unsafe, but they climbed the bell tower. The bells were gone. In the rookery, the birds were gone. Beneath the brew house, they found a vault of huge oaken casks that boomed hollowly when Hodor knocked on them. They found a library. The shelves and bins had collapsed. The books were gone and the rats were everywhere. They found a dank and dim lit dungeon with cells enough to hold 500 captives. But when Bran got, grabbed a hold of one of the rusted bars, it broke off in his hand. Only one crumbling wall remained of the great hall. The bathhouse seemed, seemed to be sinking into the ground and a huge thorn bush had conquered the practice yard outside the armory where black brothers had once labored with spears and shield and sword. The armory and the forge stood, still stood, however, the cobwebs, rats, and dust had taken the place of blades, bellows, and anvil. Sometimes Summer would hear sounds that Bran seemed deaf to, or bare his teeth at nothing, the fur on, on the back of his neck bristling, but the rat cook never put in an appearance, nor the 79 Sentinels, nor Mad Axe. Bran was much relieved. Maybe it's only a ruined, empty castle. Yeah, maybe. By the time Mira... Now, hold on, hold on here. Let me break down uh, just a couple of things that just flew by. Um, let's see here. Uh, let me go back. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, oh, okay, I, I'm just, I was scrolling the wrong way on my Kindle. That's what happened. All right, um, so... D -d 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 uh, shout out to the Dank Dungeon. Dank! Uh, 500 captives. Let's see here. Um, the bathhouse is sinking. Oh, the thorn bush. So the thorn bush conquered the practice yard. Well, over at Castle Black, it's Alistair Thorn who runs the practice yard. So shout out to Alistair Thorn. I thought that was funny, comparing him to a thorn bush. But more importantly, again, it's the language of the plants, the dead plants, some like conquering everything. Like a thorn bush isn't dead, but it's like. It's the opposite of like a juicy, succulent tree with fruits. and It's like a thorn bush, right? So the thorn bush is conquering the practice yard. And what was the other one? Um, the armory and forge still stood. Oh, the cobwebs, rats, and dust had taken the place of blades, bellows, and anvil. So just, yeah, this more very colorful language um, and more of the, the weird, you know, plants, dead plants. Spooky plants, I don't know, unpleasant, whatever you call thorn bushes. Like in the in the Garden of Eden narrative, like the thorns are part of God's curse, you know, something like that. The weeds and the thorns. So <clears throat> let's see here. Yeah. By the time Mira returned, the sun was only a sword's breath above the western hills. A sun sword, you don't say. What did you see? Her brother Jojen asked her. I saw the haunted forest, she said in a wistful tone. Hills rising wild as far as the eye can see, covered with trees that no axe has ever touched. I saw the sunlight glinting off a lake and clouds sweeping in from the west. I saw patches of old snow and icicles long as pikes. I even saw an eagle circling. I think he saw me too. I waved at him. Uh-oh. <laughs> I could have been a skin changer eagle. Did you see a way down? No, it's a sheer drop and the ice is so smooth. Um, let's see here. Blah, 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 blah. No, his sister agreed. Are you sure this is the place you saw in your dreams? Maybe we have the wrong castle. No, this is the castle. There is a gate here, Jojen says. Yes, thought Bran, but it's blocked by stone and ice. As the sun began to set, the shadows of the towers lengthened, and the wind blew harder, sending gusts of dry leaves, dry dead leaves rattling through the yards. The gathering gloom put Bran in mind of another of old Nan's stories, the tale of Night's King. He had been the thirteenth man to lead the Night's Watch, she said, 
a warrior who knew no fear. And that was the fault in him, she would add, for all men must know fear. A woman was his downfall, a woman glimpsed from atop the wall, with skin as white as the moon and eyes like blue stars. Fearing nothing, he chased her and caught her and loved her, though her skin was cold as ice. And when he gave her his seed, he gave her his soul as well. So like we were saying a minute ago, this sounds like a magical transformation that's happening as Night's King gives himself to this sorceress woman. Yeah. It, I mean, Stannis and Melisandre vibes totally just in the opposite direction. Uh, taking, you know, strips of your soul. Uh, it doesn't seem like they... Like you have to cast him maybe in quite the same way. Like she takes a piece of the soul and then casts it into a purpose or a being for, and because it's fire in nature, it burns out quickly. Whereas like the spell that's cast with ice magic over dead beings, you know, it preserves and, you know, they just exist as long as they're ice. It seems like they get destroyed by, you know, fire magic and other little mechanisms to take down that magic, but. Yeah. So you see again, how nicely the themes and the magic are complementary. Like the others are literally frozen. So they want to freeze the cycles of time. They want to freeze the, the death, death life process and create these eternally not living undead things. So yeah. Who kill the living. Because, like, the dead are supposed to stay in the ground and make room for the next generation. That's why the old men in the north go off to die in a snowstorm if there's not enough food during the winter, so that the young people can eat. So the whites are an inversion of that. It's the dead refusing to stay dead and instead killing the living and taking the place of the living. So it's, it's unholy in a deep sense. But, <clears throat> yes, there is this transformation, like you were saying, so... Night's King gives her his seed, and now he becomes frozen. He gives, he's now, you know, soulless or something like that. So he is now in some sort of half-living state, you might say. So he brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed her a queen and himself her king, and with strange sorceries he bound his sworn brothers to his will. For thirteen years they had ruled Night's King and his corpse queen, till finally the Stark of Winterfell and the enjoyment of the wildlings had joined to free the Watch from bondage. After his fall, when it was found that he had been sacrificing to the others, all records of Night's King had been destroyed, his very name forbidden. Some say he was a Bolton, Old Nan would always add. Some say a Magnar out of the Skagos. Some would say Umber, Flint, or Nori. Some would have you think he was a Woodfoot, from them who ruled Bear Island before the Iron Men came. He never was. He was a Stark, the brother of the man who brought him down who is said to be Brandon the Breaker, by the way. She always pinched Bran on the nose then, and he would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell, and who can say? Mayhaps his name was Brandon. Mayhaps he slept in this very bed, in this very room. No, Bran thought, but he walked in this castle, where we'll sleep tonight. He did not like that notion very much at all. Night's King was only a man by light of day, old Nan would always say, but the night was his to rule. And it's getting dark. So now he sounds like a werewolf. We're like, oh, during the day he's a man. But when night comes, he turns into a monster. They did the monster <laughs> match. Now what I think is that, rather, and again, this is heresy. I think Night's King and Queen definitely lived during the long night. Even though it says he's the 13th Lord Commander. And you'd think, okay, well, the Night's Watch was formed to fight the others, so 13 Lord Commanders is like 200 years after the Long Night. I think there's some funny business here. There's multiple answers as to why it could be. There could have been other Lord Commanders before the Long Night. The Watch could have been formed of a previous fighting force that had Lord Commanders. 12 Lord Commanders could have died during the fight with the others. Um, there's He could have been called the 13th Lord Commander for some occult reason. Because remember, the records were burned. Now this is a myth. So he ruled for 13 years, and he was the 13th Lord Commander. Maybe that's more symbolism and occult associations than specific numbers. Um, in any case, 
when it says the night was his to rule, like, what do you think they're talking about, dude? He's the biggest, baddest guy we've ever heard of. He rules the night fort. He creates white walkers. He gave his soul to night's queen. The night that he rules has to be the long night, in my opinion. Heresy, I know, but what are your feelings on that talk? And you can disagree with me. It's okay. No, I think uh, I think you're onto something. I think that I was trying to go back to find it, but I I know they said the thirteenth Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, but I thought it uh, there was maybe a different spot where the language was a little looser. It was almost like the thirteenth mm-hmm. person to to like run the fort or something like that. I didn't want to go back because I was going to lose my place, but I thought it had said something about. 13th generally and not specifically Lord Commander, but it may not be this section. 13th so that's why man to lead the watch is what it says. Yes. Yes. And that's not a Lord Commander. According you're right. to what you're saying, the agreement and the duty could be to guard the fort and the tree, kind of like uh, a guard, like a Garth Greenhand oath type of deal where uh, the order of the Greenhand is kind of run uh, probably at ley lines and hinges. Uh, or, you know, in heavy weirwood grove areas. But this is one of those spots where you have a heavy forest on the north side of it and a big forest just south of it. So it seems like it would have been a prime spot. It would have been the center of like a giant forest back in the day before that ice wall was there. And that's where that that castle or the, the night fort would have been, was right at the center of that. Uh, yeah, if I could just, just jump in real quick, you're, that's a great yeah. point. All the old castles of the first men were built around Weirwoods. And this, and this is another reason why I think the Night Fort would have been built around the Weirwood organism is because that's what the first men did. And these, any place where there's a big heart tree like that is essentially like a ley line or a hinge of the world. Like if Melisandre goes to Winterfell, I'm sure she'll be like, oh, my magic is really strong here too. For sure. Storm's End, same thing. So... Yeah. Yes, it's a pattern, building castles around weirwood trees. There's probably a magical reason that has to do with the long night and, you know, having a redoubt against the others. Something like that. But you were, ta- you were talking specifically just about the fact that his duty was way before, like, the timeline of the long night and them existing before that. Like, it wasn't necessarily that they were put in place just for that. They had a purpose before that even came into being and the 13th person to run it versus 13th Lord Commander would, would suggest that. So I do like that. Thanks for bringing me back to that. Yes, that's, that's a very cool specific version of that idea that you've just come up with, that their original duty was to watch that Weirwood and that castle. That makes a lot of sense to me because that Weirwood is unique. Unless, I mean, unless the Winterfell Weirwood also has a talking face down in the crypts. By the way, that's possible. Um, but it, then we just have to say that, well, the Winterfell Weirwood and the Nightfort Weirwood and maybe five or six others are all very unique and important because they have a talking face. So it's a, it's a very important Weirwood thing. It's very unique. So it would make sense if there were not only a castle built around it, but a special watch built to create it. And it could have been a corruption of that watch that is really recorded in the story of Night's King. So... You have to remember, these are all legends. And specifically, it said the record of his name and existence was burned. So we're talking about a word-of-mouth legend about history that was destroyed. Okay? So we shouldn't take any of this too literally. And by the way, yes, um, Devil Deep, 13 years is a great potential length of time for the original Long Night to have lasted which is another reason why this whole story sounds like knights, queen, and king taking power at the beginning of the long night and then creating others for 13 years while the darkness fell and the others advanced over the lands of man. I mean, that's that's what I see myself, but yeah. Yeah, because it seems like all the long night stories come from places that would have been hit hard by winter. You know, it doesn't... It seems like that is describing their rule more than it's describing like a cataclysm that hit all of Westeros in this. Like if it was something that covered all the lands, you'd get really similar myths from the South where you're getting 
word of mouth, but I don't, I don't think there were stories like that from the Southern parts of Westeros. Well, I think what happened, and I've talked about this before, um, you have to think about the long night as a bit of a bottleneck. So whatever cultural institutions existed before the long night probably would not have survived. And the people in power wouldn't have necessarily been in power afterwards. Most people died. It would have turned into chaos and starvation and anarchy. So everything is kind of rebooted after that. And in fact, I think a lot of the legends from the Age of Heroes, quote unquote, are actually from just after the long night. That's when these new households and bloodlines would have been established. So their their memories of the long night event would have been legendary. And even though there's not specific long night memories in the South, there are legends that sound like long night cataclysms. Like the storm that Durin God's grief withstands sounds like a, a fallout of the breaking mm. of the arm of Dorne. This giant mm -hmm. tidal wave. That's what we would have gotten when the arm of Dorne broke. Same thing with the Grey King. There's a flood in his story. There's the sea dragon drowning islands. Something that sounds like a meteor with that thunderbolt. So there's sort of footprints of it all over. But they really only talk about the others and the, and the darkness in the north. Um, I just think that's where they've kept the best you know, records of that stuff. But they probably have it down in the Citadel too or something like that, you know? And you're talking about the sources and we always talk about the unreliability of things that come from the Citadel, but the way that they describe the sources around the night fort, it was like one of the sources is scary stories of the North passed down through word of mouth. And the other one is like chronicles of the night fort, like stories, I guess, as it was described in there. But it seemed like you can always rely on the, the stories that are getting passed down to, to carry whatever, like, cause that's all the information we're getting. So George is giving us that history in those little bits and pieces that come through the word of mouth. You know, that's our rubric for deciphering the muddled history that we get through everything else. Yes, that's very well said. And I agree with that totally. I think it's, you just sort of have to cross. There's always some truth in the legend. So you have to use common sense and the other clues that we have to sort of figure out what actually happened. And that's why I keep saying Night Skin King and Queen probably lived during the long night, because it just makes more sense um, in so many ways to me. So uh, let me pause the narrative here, talk, and grab a couple of super chats that have been building up. Um, Eric says, the glacier... Oh, I read that. Let's see. Um, J-Lord says... No excess in First Men castles, but unlike the HBO show where there were all kinds of luxuries in Winterfell, the book Starks uh, were, had lots of silver and velvet and are far richer than the show Starks. That's actually true. <clears throat> they do. They've got fancy silver wolf brooches and things. Yeah. Uh, Fernieek says, Hope you will look into Legion, the TV series, for deep symbolism and Jungian insights. Uh, and Spinning Silver by Naomi Novik with portrayals of Stark. Okay, I'll have to check that out. Thanks for the recommendation. Um, Legion, I think I saw an ad for that. It did look interesting. We'll have to circle back to that one. Thanks for the rec. Christy Angel says, In Casterly Rock, there's a room, the Golden Gallery, that contains their most prized possessions, including part of a wall. Um, what? I'm not... I'd have to I have to Where go back it? and do research really on that wrong. one, Krista. You you stumped me with that. I I don't remember that at all. Golden it's Gallery. Really see, let me see if I can look it up. Yeah. Oh yeah, that does sound familiar. Yeah, he was bragging about all the Casterly Rock stuff. Um. Let's see here. Gilded ornaments and walls. Hmm. The Hall of Heroes is where the Lannisters and their close kin who have died valiantly are interred. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I got nothing for you on that, hmm. to be honest. I would, I would have to read the context. I don't know where they'd get a wall. I mean, I Can't guess it's just like... significant walls down there. Isn't a gilded wall down there? 
process, they've made artwork out of like hammered brass and stuff and then stuck it to the wall. Which like the ornaments are, are gilded and the walls are gilded? I'm, I'm like trying to... Descriptor. I'm trying to look More it than up. It's decorated with ornaments and walls. I, I see what Minty's saying. Like it can read more like that the ornaments are gilded and the walls are gilded more so than the hall ha than the gallery has gilded ornaments and gilded walls <clears throat> okay yeah i'm gonna have to table that and look into it in the future but yeah i don't i don't think it means anything in terms of like deep magic or anything like that it's i think it's just it's fancy stuff it's a that chunk the of ice wall. That'd be that'd be a game changer if there's a big chunk of ice wall at the Lannisters. Well, they castle. do have a giant weirwood that grows in a kind of grotto at the bottom of Casterly Rock, which is pretty cool. So that one's a very weird like weirwood. Um and of course Winterfell's weirwood has the pond right below it too. So let's see here. Eric or Eldrick Stoneskin says, do you think the Night King could be a demonized memory of the last hero? Yes, that's possible. If the last hero and his 12 were resurrected, they could be seen as evil. And it's possible that all that giving babies to the others. Well, some people think that that's what the last hero had to do to make a pact with the others to get them to stop killing everyone is to make a pact where they you know, people were going to give them babies. Um, so... That is that is a very popular and old theory, absolutely. Uh, that the last be hero became Night's King, yes. What's your thought about that? Oh, that would be heroic if uh, if you think of his act. I mean, they describe it more like he chases her down and it sounds a little more salty than romantic in the way that they tell the story. Uh, but I'm thinking if he knew that he would have to die in order to give his men the power that they needed to have in order to, def to defend the realm or something like that, then maybe it's a heroic sacrifice to give your seed and soul to the corpse queen. Then it could be a hero, you know, in some people's eyes. Yeah. And a lot of people like those kind of theories because it's very George like doing something kind of dishonorable or very unpleasant for the greater good. That seems to be like what the Starks are always having to do. So, yeah, that could fit. Um, I favor that the Night's King and Last Hero were like a father-son relationship. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. And I'm not even sure who's the father and who's the son, by the way. But it could be brother-brother or uncle-nephew. Um, Brandon the Breaker was said to be the brother of Night's King, so that gives you brother-brother. There's a lot of uncle-nephew relationships that mirror Night's King and Last Hero. So it's tough to know. You know, I always talk about Azor High as maybe not even one person, but a group of mages, you know. So it's it's the same as like the various uh, gemstone emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn. Well, they could be uh, dynasties. Amethyst Empress could be a dynasty. Opal Emperor could be the Opal, you know, House Opal very easily. So mm -hmm. you have to consider all possibilities when you're talking with interpreting old legends like this. But to, you could also see, like what he was saying, with uh, Brandon the Breaker being viewed as the hero that travels north to conquer the knights. Like if it's his brother, he's the one that they're painting as the hero, even though in our eyes he's kind of teaming up with Jorman to kill the people that maybe are doing something good up on the wall. Yes, and, the, and we should expect some kind of reversal like that. I mean, that's, you know, if you've read A Song of Ice and Fire, you just kind of know how it goes. I, I think some... They're going to pull out the rug out from under us somehow. And, well, not they, George. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be very muddled as far as the bad guy and the good guy. We all expect there to be truths about the utter, other, the others, about the others that render them more than just nipples on a cow. Oh, those are udders. No, the others more than just mindless ice demons, right, Talk? Yeah. They, I mean, the agreements that they have with, the Andals, I was looking at that too, the crowns, the different symbolism of the crowns and the combining of bronze and iron symbolism in the crowns with different agreements that they've made and how like the Starks aligning with the Andals in the North uh, is a split in allegiance between the wildlings north of the wall, like the, the Starks south of the wall are now aligning with the Andals and the people north of the wall still hate the Andals. 
So if there's a Stark family member that like defects from the house, you know, maybe goes up to the wall, that would be the, you know, the person that would have the vendetta against, you know, a Stark that would actually want to go against the Starks. Like a, maybe the reason why. Yeah, and maybe that's part of like Mance's whole reasoning about taking John in. He saw him as that kind of a figure, like, oh, a Stark who's bitter against the Starks actually would make a good foe for the Starks. Yeah, I dig it. Okay, so we just read the whole Night's King uh, bit. Oh, and real quick, um, Cody Landry says, glad to finally caught you live, and he's asking... How do you think the next, how long do you think the next long night will last? Well, probably just a few weeks because there's only so many books left. And once it falls, I'm sure the heroes have to get busy fighting it. Um, I expect it to fall at the end of Winds of Winter and to be resolved two thirds of the way through A Dream of Spring. So a few weeks, a month or two, something like that. Um, the point is, it will go on forever if it's not interrupted. So, yeah. Like three months. It'll just be a normal winter. All right. So, um, uh, let's. we've got a big passage coming up here. Take this first paragraph, at least. The Reeds decided. The Reeds decided that they would sleep in the kitchens. A stone octagon with a broken dome. Now the broken dome. Uh, cracked moon meteors, anyone? Uh, it looked to offer better shelter than most of the other buildings, even though a crooked weirwood had burst up through the slate floor beside a huge central well, stretching slantwise toward the hole in the roof, its bone white branches reaching for the sun. It was a queer kind of tree, skinnier than any other weirwood that Brain had ever seen, and faceless as well. But it made him feel as as if the old gods were with him here, at least. So first thing, real quick, it's reaching for the sun. And obviously plants grow towards the sun. That's not a big thing. But in a minute, we're going to see this tree trying to grab the moon. So now when you look back here, like, oh, reaching for the sun, actually, that's kind of menacing. And of course, the night fort... If it's the if Night's King is the one who caused the long night, like I say, then this could be the place where the sun was first blotted out, or where some part of the magic that that made that happen went down. Or you'd say it's the place where Night's King took power during the long night. So we've got this weirwood reaching for the sun here. It's definitely symbolism implying like reaching for the sun to kill it, to drag it down. And to cause the darkness. Um, yeah. So uh, go ahead. And, and keep... uh, go ahead. Broken, broken dome. You know, like I said, also goes to your your theory on the the shattered moon. Right. It's a it's a broken dome there. of a planet, or even more generally, I interpreted it just as like the dome of heaven has been broken. It's been shattered because the stars are falling. The stars are bleeding. So that's that's basically how I looked at it. Like it's a planet Arium, and uh, the dome is broken. And the werewolves are like the hands of the 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 people trying to reach out for the power of the gods, shattering the moon, the sky. Yes, it's like Michelangelo's painting of David and or Adam and God. Only it's much more destructive. Well, it's the next scene in the the photo series. Oh, right after right yeah. after this. Everything is destroyed. You gotta keep gotta keep reading, yeah. Speaking of which No brand <laughs> No brand thought. But he walked in this castle where we where we'll sleep tonight. Oh no, he you not you've like lost your place. You've lost your place. You went back a couple oh, pages. Yeah. That's so weird. Whoop. I'll pick it up and you can find it oh, as I'm reading. That was that was the only thing he liked about the kitchens though. The roof was mostly there, so they'd be dry if it rained again, but he didn't think they would ever get warm here. You could feel the cold seeping up through the flo- through the slate floor. Brand did not like the shadows either, or the huge brick ovens that surrounded them like open mouths, or the rusted meat hooks, or the scars and stains he saw in the butcher's block along the wall. 
that was where the rat cook chopped the prince to pieces, you know, and he baked the pie in one of those ovens. It's all that's missing is like a couple of chainsaws hanging down, right? It's, it's the murder shed, basically. In that series, too, he starts and you're like, okay, just to cut. And then he just keeps going. Or the or the rusted meat hooks. Yeah, just <laughs> the rusted going. meat hooks, yeah. Or the scars and stains on the butcher block, yeah. <clears throat> and then it says the well was the thing he liked the least, though. It was a good 12 feet across. So, guys, it's not even a well. That's like a giant hole in the floor. I mean, wells are like three feet across. This is 12 feet across. So, yeah. Um, it's, it's all stone with steps built into its side, circling down and down into the darkness. The walls were damp and covered with nitre, but none of them could see the water at the bottom. Not even Mira with her sharp hunter's eyes. Maybe it doesn't have a bottom, Bran said, uncertainly. Yeah. So, Mines of Moria, you're getting that feel here. Um, it's really weird they can't see the bottom. Like, it's dark, yeah, but 12-foot wide well, like, you could probably see a long way down. Um, and when they climb down, they can see the moon overhead. So, like, there is moonlight slanting down, but, yeah, it's basically, yeah, it's a pit. Thank you, Gerald. It almost drinks the moonlight. It does. Uh, what's the name of that blood sacrifice hole? What's that thing? What's that thing called? Anakarayan or something from oh. the uh, show. Um, you know what I'm talking about in South America. Uh, when are you talking about the cenotes when they used to throw people in there? Well, it's the the name for the blood sacrifice hole on House of the Dragon. Oh, it starts with I thought it was started thought it started with an a but like you're talking about the inaugurion inaugurion well i think that's the tower but it did end in a pit though yes that's what it made me think of is that giant like a blood sacrifice hole and if you're dripping blood down to the weirwood tree that would it would be like a sacrificial temple like yes definitely that's that is that is definitely the idea here absolutely 100 percent um and when they say maybe it doesn't have a bottom you know, another place that we've seen a bottomless body of water, supposedly, is the pond in front of the Winterfell heart tree. Brand mm-hmm. Brand says, "Oh, I supposedly supposedly it doesn't have a bottom." And Mira's like, "Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't." You know, she's not going to say like Benjen. So you're supposed to think of sort of a magical body of water when they say that there's no bottom. This is more like an abyss or you know, like a portal into the chaos realm or something. I guess portal is the right word. It reminds me of the womb of the world too. I think that was another one that they describe as being like a pretty deep lake. So uh, it says Hodor peered over the knee high lip of the well and said, Hodor, the word echoed down the well, Hodor, 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 until it was less than a whisper. Hodor looked startled. Then he laughed and bent to scoop up a broken piece of slate off the floor. And this is straight up Mines of Moria, of course. He throws it down. Hodor, don't. You shouldn't have done that. You don't know what's down there. You might have hurt something or woken something up. And it says far below they heard the sound as the stone found water. It wasn't a splash, not truly. It was more of a gulp. As if whatever was below had opened a quivering, gelid mouth to swallow Hodor's stone. That's a Lovecraftian word. Faint echoes traveled up the well, and for a moment Bran thought he heard something moving, thrashing about in the water. Maybe we shouldn't stay here, he said uneasily. By the well? asked Mira. Or in the night fort? Yes, Bran said. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You want to pick it up with she laughed? She laughed and sent Hodor out to gather wood. Summer went too. It was almost dark by then, and the dire wolf wanted to hunt. Hodor returned alone with both arms full of dead wood and broken branches. Jojen Reed took his flint and knife and set about lighting the fire while Mira boned the fish she caught at the, at the last stream they'd crossed. Bran wondered how many years had passed since there had last been a supper cooked in the kitchens of the night for it. He wondered who had cooked it too, though maybe it was better not to know. 
When the flames are blazing nicely, Mira put the fish on. At least it's not a meat pie. The rat cook had cooked the son of the Andal King in a big pie with onions, carrots, mushrooms, lots of pepper and salt, and a rasher of bacon, and a dark red Dornish wine. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. You just you can see George like starting the sentence. The rat cook had <laughs> cooked the son of the Andal King in a big pie. Oh, I like pie. Yeah, onions, carrots, mushrooms, lots of pepper and salt, <laughs> and a little bit of bacon, and oh, what was that? That's right. Oh, the rat cook. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> gotta love and george keep going sorry it's another uh i mean we can go back to it but it's another thing targeted at an andal king like this is the second thing in the list of night fort acts that have been against andal king specifically true uh, then he served him to his father who praised the taste and had a second slice afterward the gods transformed the cook into a monstrous white rat who could only eat his own young he had roamed the night fort ever since, devouring his children, but still his hunger was not sated. It was not for murder that the gods cursed him, old man said, nor for serving the Andal King his son in a pie. A man has a right to vengeance, but he slew a guest beneath his roof, and that the gods cannot forgive. So this is maybe a tie back to the Red Wedding, because if you remember... <clears throat> Bran was thinking about the Red Wedding at the beginning of the chapter. So this is George letting us know what the phrase did is going to carry a heavy, heavy punishment. Um, I think that is the main purpose of this line. It's actually not for Bran, but rather for the reader to think about with the Red Wedding. Um, but I also mentioned that my theory on the the, the rat is that that's, it's, it's uh, some sort of symbol about the greens, the weirwood trees, and the green seers that are inside them absorbing their all of their descendants, essentially. But I'm not sure where that goes, really. So mm, I got you. The white thing consuming all of its children. The white monster. Yeah, with red eyes. Exactly. I think it's maybe just building up the dread. If you know, to the extent that someone figures out that this is about a weirwood tree, building up the dread for Bran wedding the tree. You know, he's gonna become the next meal for the weirwood in a sense. So I also, when I saw the list, like the way that they list, uh, it was almost like they listed off all the myths and history surrounding the night fort, like anything they could think of that was in reference to the night fort. And they listed off Knights King, Rat Cook, 79 Sentinels, Danny Flint, King Sherrett, Apprentice Boys, Simeon Star Eyes and Mad Axe. And like just talking about all the things that went on at the night fort, this is more like the rat cook is another example of them talking about how at some point everything at the night fort went wild like everyone started killing themselves killing each other you know being crazy walking around with blood dripping from their hands and like that was the noise you heard around the castle uh specifically talking about people going mad too i think there was a group that they said went mad uh the apprentice boys the face of the thing that came in the night and then went crazy. My thought, because you read Maddox right after that, it's like one of maybe one of those is one of those crazy people that went crazy is Maddox. You know, that's just wandering around now with blood dripping from his hands, being a crazy guy. But it seems like everything's going down. And this is just another example illustrating uh, the darkness that fell over the night for it. Uh, muted. I was just saying, and once again, it's very like Heron Hall, just a cursed place where, yeah. But you, you do wonder how much of this shit happened at once. Um, it does sound just like a one, one big horror movie. <clears throat> so he says, uh, we should sleep, Jojen said solemnly after they were full. The fire was burning low. He stirred it with a stick. Perhaps I'll have another green dream to show us the way. Hodor was already curled up and snoring lightly. From time to time he thrashed beneath his cloak and whimpered something that he might have been Hodor. Bran wriggled closer to the fire. The warmth felt good and the soft crackling of flames soothed him, but sleep would not come. Outside, the wind was sending armies of dead leaves marching across the courtyards to scratch faintly at the doors and windows. The sounds made him think of old Nan's stories. He could almost hear the ghostly sentinels calling to each other atop the wall and winding their ghostly war horns. <clears throat> so we've got armies of dead leaves, 
And again, the ghostly sentinels who are named after trees. This is all others talk as, you know, dead trees. And whites are also compared to like dead wood as well. Then it says, here comes the payoff line. Pale moonlight slanted down through the hole in the dome, painting the branches of the weirwood as they strained up toward the roof. It looked as if the tree was trying to catch the moon and drag it down into the well. Old gods, Bran prayed, if you hear me, don't send a dream tonight. Or if you do, make it a good dream. The gods made no answer. So this is, I mentioned this earlier, with the tree reaching for the sun, it's menacing. Here they are trying to pull the moon down into the well. Um, so that's bad. I mean, that's, there's a lot of Odin stuff going on here that I've broken down before. I don't want to get too lost in that. But uh, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it's, I don't think there's a lot more than what you said. I think the the fact that they're straining up towards the roof and the roof being a dome that was cracked just goes back towards the <clears throat> like the magic being the thing that that broke the world or that that led shadow to covering the world um but i think it's the same thing talking about the pale moonlight i think that disappearing into the hole is supposed to evoke the the metal that we've seen that drinks moonlight and things like that and how magic drinks moonlight in a weird way it absorbs light rather than reflects it. Old gods and, was another thing on there. There's also, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I um, I bought a new bong yesterday. That's what's going on. <laughs> in case somebody's Freeze wondering pie? why. They keep bleeding <laughs> off screen. Sorry. <laughs> He's just making out with minty. Quit lying. It's no. It's it's. <laughs> it's no, it's not that. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's really nice. I bought it yesterday, and anyway, um, praise Garth. Uh, the point is, is, what kind of? It's a what super kind of tornado. It it has, it it makes like three tornadoes, and it has many nice. Rube Goldberg like stems and channels and. Yeah, it's quite the thing. Shout out Rye Dyer. Uh, anyways, um, so much for this stream. Um, so uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, oh, the moon. Okay. Collecting my thoughts. So I mentioned that a lot of this... Uh, no, it's a Rye Dyer, not a Jerome Baker. Although, shout out to Jerome Baker. I used to have one of those <laughs> back in the 90s. Um, the... Uh, oh, man. I had my thoughts together. <laughs> Praise Garth. Okay, so part of the purpose of this chapter on a personal level is to build up the dread of Bran fulfilling his destiny. It's been this quest that's supposed to be a relief, an answer. You know, they're, they're, they're barely eating. They're hiding from people. They're scrambling around the north. And it's like, oh, we got to find the three-eyed crow. Bran thinks maybe he'll heal him. But at this point the narrative starts to shift and George is starting to inform us that this is going to be kind of freaky um, and that this, in fact, might be more like Bran getting eaten than anything else. And that's why at the end of the chapter, he goes through the weirwood mouth that swallows Bran. So, like, we're seeing the weirwood try to pull the moon down into the well. Well, Bran is going to end up going down into the well. So it's like this well and this weirwood it's just pulling down stuff. It's eating babies. It's pulling down the sun and the moon. And Bran is a part of that. That's kind of my point, is that the dread is supposed to be building up for Bran and the idea that he's fulfilling his destiny, but it's going to be in a dark cave full of bones. You know, in the north, it's it's not... And maybe he ate his friend or his friend's brain or something like... Yeah. So... It's a it's a pretty non traditional hero's journey. I know they keep building it <laughs> yes, up as yes, like you can say that. he's a boy before this. He's a boy. He's a green boy. He even talks about the fact that I'm immature. I'm afraid of everything, but I don't want to voice it to anyone around me. Even though that would be the thing that's really showing the bravery, speaking the fear, and proceeding. Uh, this they're kind of hinting at the fact that, and they have he has to hint at the fact that this is Brand's hero journey because we when you read it, it reads like a horror story. And you're not seeing him go on a quest and he's not saving a princess necessarily. Uh, it's way darker than that. It feels like, like a murder story. 
So he has to be like, hey, don't forget, this is, you know, he's coming into his own. He's becoming a man here as he talks about all this dark stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a good observation. Like it's a hero's journey, a hero's journey that's actually um, like a horror story or uh, yeah, descent into madness as Grateful is saying in the chat. Yep. So yeah, Heart of Darkness is something that George has referenced a couple of times. Cold Hands is a Heart of Darkness character. I forget how that works, um, but yeah. And then Anu and then Carl are mentioning Kronos, Saturn, who devours his young. That may be something we should look into if we're trying to understand the rat cook myth. And then Anu also mentioned the Wendigo, which devours but is always hungry. So yeah, it does mm -hmm. It does sound like George is tapping into that kind of, uh, kind of vibe there. Wendigo is like a northern northern myth ice ice region mythology usually is where the wendigo comes from and oh. chronos with being the god of time and uh is it saturn yes the god of time oh duh oh. duh of course the weirwoods ah, duh. <laughs> the weirwoods are obviously parallel to a god of time because they regulate time and stand outside of time so Kronos eating his young. Ah, very good. Teamwork. Nice job, guys. The, solved Teamwork. at last. All, after our only 14 years of thinking about the rat cook, we've put it together right here. <laughs> Two hours into the stream or whatever it was. Oh, and him being the white giant that's down there consuming everything is the tree itself consuming everything as time consumes all. The, the black gate consumes all as the white giant. Yes, you're right. Correct. You're totally right. Um, I didn't even make that connection either. Yeah, I just said that the Weirwood Gate is eating Bran, and the Weirwoods are eating Bran like a meal. Um, yeah, so yeah, I guess that's, uh, yeah, well done. So essentially, do, do the gate is like at, Kronos. Do you think it hints at the, the you know, I know this is a deep cut, but the, like it hints at the identity of that, or the first green seer being of the Stark line, like his father trying to consume him, like someone in his line being that father. Yeah, that would make it fit better, wouldn't it? If if there if there was a human, you know, whatever human went into making the Black Gate or whatever the first green seer attached to it, yeah, would have been a Stark, and that way it's eating. And that's what that tear means. Remember, Bran goes through, and there's a drip of water that says it was salty as a tear that drips down from the, the mouth of the thing. So yeah, maybe that's it. It's the ancestor. That's a little bit sad. Like, Oh yeah, Brand, you got to go fulfill your destiny, but it's not going to be that fun. Sorry. You know? Oh yeah. The sadness nice. of consuming. Yeah. I didn't even think of that. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense. So we'll get there. Um, yeah. With the chapter. The so brain. next page. Um, Bran made himself close his eyes. Maybe he even slept some, or maybe he was just drowsing, floating the way you do when you're half awake and half asleep, trying not to think about Mad Axe or the rat cook or the thing that came in the night. Then he heard the noise. His eyes opened. What was that? He held his breath. Did I dream it? Was I having a stupid nightmare? He didn't want to wake Mira and Jojen for a bad dream, but there, a soft scuffling sound far off, Leaves, its leaves rustling off the walls outside and rustling together, or, or the wind. It could be the wind. The sound wasn't coming from outside, though. Bran felt the hairs on his arms start to rise. The sound's inside. It's in here with us, and it's getting louder. He pushed himself up onto an elbow, listening. There was wind, and blowing leaves as well. But this was something else. Footsteps. Someone was coming this way. Something was coming this way. All right, let's let's hear your best horror reading voice talk. Let's do it. It wasn't the Sentinels, he knew. The Sentinels never left the wall. But there might be other ghosts in the night for it. One's even more terrible. He remembered what old Nan had said of Mad Axe. How he took his boots off and prowled the castle's halls barefoot in the dark. With never a sound to tell you where he was except for the drops of blood that fell from his axe. And his elbows 
and the end of his wet red beard. Or maybe that wasn't Mad Axe at all. Maybe it was the thing that came in the night. The Prentice boys all saw it, Old Nan said. But afterward, when they told their Lord Commander, every description had been different. And three died within the year, and the fourth went mad. And a hundred years later, when the thing had come again, the Prentice boys were seen shambling along behind it, all in chains. So again, we see this theme of like children being taken captive. Um, you know, that's a lot of this is about children. Uh, the babies that are being given to the others. Bran being a child that's being consumed by the by the weirwoods, essentially. And so I don't know what the whole Mad Axe thing is about, but or the thing that came in the night, rather. But we can see that it's enslaving the Prentice boys. So it's all of, of a piece thematically. And uh, the other thing I noticed is that the blood dripping from his red beard, that's definitely a blood beard shout out. Blood beard is thought of mostly as a pirate legend, but actually goes back to before there's before the pirate version, there's older versions of the blood beard myth. So um, I, I, I'm not well schooled up, uh, schooled up enough on it to break it down, but that is definitely a blood beard reference. So that's something we should go explore if you want to understand what uh, what that Mad Axe thing is about. But basically, it's a whole bunch of murder. I know that much. And, I mean, he's been... It's suggesting he's definitely been eating people, right? That's, Or maybe he's been causing such a mess that it's he's got splash up on his face and his beard. One or the other. Um, but it certainly uh, starts to sound like another weirwood face symbolism. A bloody beard. You know, we've seen the snow you. beard thing, so... Um, all right, so let's see here. That was only a story, though. He was just scaring himself. There was no thing that comes in the night. Maester Lewin had said so. And if there ever had been such a thing, it was gone from the world now, like giants and dragons. It's nothing, Bran thought. But the sounds were louder now. It's coming from the well, he realized. That made him even more afraid. Something was coming up from under the ground, coming up from out of the dark. Hodor woke it up. He woke it up with that stupid piece of slate, and now it's coming. <laughs> It was hard to hear over Hodor's snores and the thumping of his own heart. Was that the sound blood made dripping from an axe? Or was it the faint, far-off rattling of ghostly chains? Bran listened harder. Footsteps. It was definitely footsteps. Pardon me. Each one a little louder than the one before. He couldn't tell how many, though. The well made the sounds echo. He didn't hear any dripping or any chains. But there was something else. A high, thin, whimpering sound, like someone in pain, and heavy, muffled breathing. But the footsteps were loudest. <laughs> the footsteps were coming closer. Bran was too frightened to shout. The fire had burned down to a few faint embers, and his friends were all asleep. He almost slipped his skin and reached out for his wolf, but Summer might be miles away. He couldn't leave his friends helpless in the dark to face whatever was coming up out of the well. I told them not to come here, he thought miserably. I told them they were... There were ghosts. I told them we should go to Castle Black. The footfalls sounded heavy to Bran, slow, ponderous, scraping against the stone. It must be huge. Mad Axe had been a big man in Old Man's story, and the thing that came in the night had been monstrous. Back in Winterfell, Sansa had told him that the demons of the dark couldn't touch him if he hid beneath his blanket. He almost did that now, before he remembered that he was a prince, and almost a man grown. Everyone's almost a man grown in this story. I love that. It's like you're three years old. Almost a man grown. It's a lot of pressure. Rickon's got to grow up. He shouldn't be frightened of wolves. He's three. He's almost three. Gosh. He'll be sorry right, his own children soon. <laughs> anyway. Um, Bran, this is pretty much just action here, so I'll just keep reading. Um, it's building up the tension, you know. Bran wriggled across the floor, dragging his dead legs behind him until he could reach out and touch Mira on the foot. She woke at once. He had never known anyone to wake as quick as Mira Reed, or to be so alert so fast. Bran pressed a finger to his mouth so she'd know not to speak. She heard the sound at once. He could see that on her face. The echoing footfalls, the faint whimpering, the heavy breathing. Mira rose to her feet without a word and reclaimed her weapons. With her three-pronged frog spear in her right hand and the folds of her net dangling from her left, she slipped barefoot toward the well. Jojen dozed on, oblivious, while Hodor muttered 
and thrashed in restless sleep. She kept to the shadows as she moved, stepped around the shaft of moonlight as quiet as a cat. And by the way, Mira is just total badass. She doesn't even wake anyone else up. She's just like, okay, I'm going to take care of this. Just awesome. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, Bran was watching her all the while, and even he could barely see the faint sheen of her spear. Uh, I can't let her fight the thing alone, he thought. Summer was far away, but... He slipped his skin and reached for Hodor. It was not like sliding into Summer. That was so easy now, Bran hardly thought about it. This was harder, like trying to pull a left boot on your right foot. It fit all wrong, and the boot was scared, too. The boot didn't know what was happening. The boot was pushing the foot away. The boot was a person. He tasted vomit in the back of Hodor's throat, and that was almost enough to make him flee. Instead, he squirmed and shoved, sat up, gathered his legs under him, his huge, strong legs, and rose. I'm standing, he took a step. I'm walking. It was such a strange feeling that he almost fell. He could see himself on the cold stone floor, a little broken thing, but he wasn't broken now. He grabbed Hodor's longsword. The breathing was as loud as a blacksmith's bellows. All right, would you pick it up there? Yeah. From the well came a wail, a piercing creech that went through him like a knife. A huge black shape heaved itself up into the darkness and lurched toward the moonlight. And the fear rose up in Bran so thick that before he could even think of drawing Hodor's sword the way he'd meant to, he found himself back on the floor again with Hodor roaring, Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. The way he had in the lake tower whenever the lightning flashed. But the thing that came in the night was screaming too and thrashing wildly in the folds of Mira's net. Bran saw her spear dart out of the darkness to snap at it. And the thing staggered and fell, struggling with the net. The wailing was still coming from the well, even louder, even louder now. On the floor, the black thing flopped and fought, screeching, No, no, please, please don't. The sand Mira that came in the him. night. I just, sorry, I had to say that. Keep going. <laughs> right? It, it, and it, when you know it's Sam, too, it sounds like a bunch of, like, thinly veiled fat jokes that they're doing all along the way, describing him. Because we know it's, you know, we know it's Sam. But they're describing his size and the sounds he makes when he walks and his heavy breathing. It's like, give Sam a break, man. He's struggling. I'm well, I, in fairness to Sam, though, it sounds like there's a lot of steps. Uh, so, I mean, you'd, you would be pretty tired. And not only that, there's also, um, a lot of this whale symbolism, I believe is tied to, uh, Leviathan symbolism. Sam is called Leviathan because he is so big. Um, and Leviathan is a word that's used for whales in this book, but Leviathans are also sea dragons in the classic mythological, uh, mythological sense. So remember when they said like, oh, there's something swimming in the water, and there's something coming up like there's an aspect of that that's about the dragon rising from the ocean. It's it's a bit off the beaten track as far as what we're talking about here. But there is a point to the whale symbolism. Even more on topic is the sound, the wailing sound. It says a piercing creech that went through him like a knife. That's That sound is frequently found in these scenes of mythical astronomy symbolism that's nissa nissa's scream that broke the moon um the moon was actually broken by a comet that was like a sword or a knife but the legend says it was a scream so there's a lot of scream sword symbolism widow's whale is a sword for example um so that's it's just more of that here uh and it's this is also the screaming hinge so we see like the door is opening up. Something is coming out from the underworld. So it's an appropriate place to have that hinge symbolism. It's like a, a dead thing coming into the realm of the living. Or you could say coming from the dead side of the wall back to the living side of the wall. Um, so yeah, that's, that's happening. Go ahead. Carry on, sir. Mirror stood over him. The moonlight shining silver off the prongs of a frog spear. Who are you? She demanded. I'm Sam, the black thing sobbed. Sam, I'm, I'm Sam, let me out, you, you stabbed me. He rolled through the puddle of moonlight, flailing and flopping in the tangles of Mira's net. Hodor was still shouting, Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. 
It was Jojen who fed the sticks to the fire and blew on them until the flames leapt up crackling. Then there was light, and Bran saw the pale, thin-faced girl by the lip of the well, all bundled up in her furs and skins beneath an enormous black coat, cloak, trying to shush the screaming baby in her arms. The thing on the floor was pushing an arm through the net to reach his knife, but the loops wouldn't let him. He wasn't any monster beast or even mad axe drenched in gore, only a big fat man dressed up in black wool, black fur, black leather, and black mail. He's a black brother, said Bran. Mira, he's from the Night's Watch. Hodor, said Hodor. Hodor? <laughs> yeah. So let's pause it there. Um, so yeah, just great writing. It's scary. It's scary. And then all of a sudden, the reader's kind of putting it together. Be like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's a Night's Watch brother. And it turns out to be Sam. So just... Like I said, this is one of the best chapters in the book. This is one of the reasons why. Not for only for all the symbolism, but just the way that he cut the tension here. The tension is building up through this chapter in an insane way. And this is how he breaks it. It's, oh, it's Sam. Like, it's ridiculous, it's hilarious, man. and it's, it's funnier because of all that tension that's been built up. So it's great writing. I just love it. Um, let me pick this up here. Oh, did you have something to say? Uh, just the the black thing sobbed. He rolled through the puddle of moonlight, flowing and flopping in the tangles of the net. Uh, it's very fish like puddle of moonlight. Yeah, yeah. I think the like the weir like there's a lot of flipping and flopping in the in the water, like a fish out of water, and her net being the weir that pulled the fish from the water. But this is like a monster. It's not like a normal fish. This is like, like you said, a leviathan. This is the big one. So it's it's just interesting the way they're describing this as being like a catch, if, especially if it parallels anything with the weir and the fishing, if he represents something in the history, like a giant. Yeah, it does. The net, anytime you see a net, that's going to be the, like tied to the weirwoods. The weirwood net, like George is making the weirwood net joke for us. We didn't, I mean, it's a fandom term, but it's something that he's thinking about. Absolutely. He uses the spider web symbolism for the weirwood network as well. And the, um, the actual roots are like fingers and like spider webs. So it's very much netting. And then it complements the whole fishing weir idea very well. So yes, you've, you've, you nailed that. Um, Mira is acting as an agent of the weirwood tree, almost like a children of the forest. She's helping to pull this fish out of the water. And yeah, it's all aquatic symbolism. Sam, the whale, the leviathan, flopping around in the moonlight puddle. In a, in a, literally caught in a net like a fish. Um, so it's, it's pretty great stuff, yeah. They have her armed with a, like an other spear, the way they describe it. She's armed like an other. Mm -hmm. She has moonlight shining, off her, shining silver off the prongs of her frog spear. Oh, interesting. Like moon shining moonlight spears sounds like others weapons like it could be one of the the children or like one of the people of the neck that were that was able to wield the weapons of the ice somehow okay well this is the place for it certainly um that's interesting uh and knights knights it could just be talking about knight's queen quite simply so um yeah, gosh, it's been a while since I've thought about the deep symbolism in the stream. But Mira, yeah, I hadn't thought about Mira too much. But she's doing a lot here, pulling Sam out. Definitely acting as an agent of the Weirwood or somebody that's like inside the Weirwood. Could be that Sam is representing a Knight's King or a last hero. More likely the last hero than Knight's King. Um, that's usually what Sam is he, doing. Yes, he represents, yeah, that's all I was going to say. He does that a lot every time. Especially because he's rescuing um, Gilly's baby here at this very moment. So, literally, this is he's the moment. He's rescuing monsters. Yes, yeah, stealing monsters, yes. Um, rescuing. Because this is the moment when Gilly's baby is emerging into the air south of the wall and is officially safe from the White Walkers. So, <clears throat> it says, The Night's Watch, yes, the fat man was still breathing like a bellows. I'm a brother of the Watch. He had one cord under his chin, forcing his can head I, up. And can I say one more thing? Oh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. 
You know how heroes normally slay monsters and dragons and stuff? Sam in this story as the hero is saving monsters. Like that's his role. He saves monster. He's the one that rescues monster. And John and John is the dragon, I guess. Yeah. I'm just thinking flipping the hero trope on its head and having him rescue monsters versus slaying him. But that was it. That was it. Yeah, and it was Cold Hands the monster who helped pull off the rescue. Yeah. Um, so he says, okay. Um, I'm a, he had one cord under his chin, forcing his head up, and others digging deep into his cheeks. I'm a crow. Please let me out of this. So yeah, that that could that could be more other symbolism for Mira's weapons. You know, the other cords of the net could be. You never know with that other stuff. Yeah. Sometimes it's innocuous. Sometimes it's it seems like you know a double entendre. But Bran was suddenly uncertain. Are you the three-eyed crow? He can't be the three-eyed crow. Uh, I don't think so. The fat man rolled his eyes, but there were only two of them. <laughs> I'm only only two. How disappointing. I'm only Sam. Samwell Tarly. Let me out. It's hurting me. He began to struggle again. Mira made a disgusted sound. Stop flopping around. If you tear my net, I'll throw you back down the well. Just lie still and I'll untangle you. Who are you? Jojen asked the girl with the baby. Gilly, she said, for the gilly flower. He's Sam. We never meant to scare you. She rocked her baby and murmured at it, and finally it stopped crying. Mira was untangling the fat brother. Jojen went to the well and peered down. Where did you come from? From Craster's, the girl said. Are you the one? Jojen turned to look at her. The one? Could he be the one? He said that Sam wasn't the one. She explained that there was someone else, he said. The one he was sent to find. Who said? Bran demanded. Cold hands, Gilly answered softly. All right, will you take a turn there? Mira peeled back one end of her net, and the fat man managed to sit up. He was shaking, Bran saw, and still struggling to catch his breath. He said there would be people, he huffed. People in the castle. I didn't know you'd be right at the top of the steps, though. I didn't know you'd throw a net on me or stab me in the stomach. He touched his belly with the black gloved hand. Am I bleeding? I can't see. It was just a poke to get you off your feet, said Mira. Here, let me have a look. She went to one knee and felt around his navel. You're wearing mail. I never got near your skin. Well, it hurt all the same, Sam complained. Are you really a brother of the Night's Watch? Bren asked. The fat man's chins jiggled when he nodded. His skin looked pale and saggy. Only a steward. I took care of Lord Mormont's ravens. For a moment, he looked like he was going to cry. I lost them at the fist, though. It was my fault. I got us lost, too. I couldn't even find the wall. It's a 100 leagues long and 700 feet high, and I couldn't find it. Well, you found it now, said Mira. Lift your rump off the ground. I want my net back. How did you get through the wall? Jojen demanded as Sam struggled to his feet. Hold on right there. Does before, the wall... before we go any further, I just have to laugh at that. Sam going, it's 700 feet tall and made of ice and I couldn't find it. Like, As someone whose frustration sometimes overwhelms them, like I, I feel Sam on that. Like... <laughs> I have looked at myself sometimes and been like, how did I screw this up? <laughs> like, totally. Uh, you had one job, Sam, find the wall, and he couldn't, couldn't find the wall. I mean, like she said, I, I just love the, the contrast that they're doing here with Mira and Sam, where Sam and Bran are the one, like I said earlier, they're the ones painted as the traditional heroes. Like, Bran is supposed to be a hero. Sam is... Like they keep telling us that he's a hero and he keeps stumbling into these heroic, quote unquote, heroic acts, but he does it in the messiest way. He never intends to. He's always bumbling. He views himself as being, you know, a bumbling fool. And Mira's the one who's rescuing all of them. She's the one that has to help him out of the net. Like he can't even get out of it on his own and, you know, carries brand. Like she, she's, 
she's the hero and all like in this little story and everything we've seen. And I think he does a good job of showing how inept everyone except her is in this environment. hundred percent. Thanks for um, representing for Mira today. You've done well. And yes, you're, you're totally right. A lot of stuff has been inverted. And this is another reason why I think me, it might make sense to see Mira get her hands on dark sister, which is supposedly in Blood Raven's cave. You know, even if she gives it to Arya or somebody else, even John, um, yeah, she's worthy of wielding it. She's the only soldier up there that would make use of the sword right now. You know, everyone else, like they might be able to use the sword, but they're not going to make use of it in battle or anything significant. Maybe if he's, maybe if Hodor's still around and he's skin changing Hodor, then maybe you can use the sword as Hodor. But. Oh, that would be the other possibility. Actually, yes. That's, I forgot, yes, that is going to happen. Um, because Hodor gains all the Stark symbolism as he goes north. He gets a snow beard. He gets ice in his eyes when his tears freeze. There's an Edric Snowbeard mm. Stark, and there's a John Ice Eyes Stark, or Brandon Ice Eyes Stark. Um, he's wielding a sword from the crypts of Winterfell, and it's an especially rusty sword, which means that it's a red sword, like Azor High. And as he's going along and Bran is skin changing him, um, he's looking more and more like some ridiculous symbolism laden warrior, like a weird snowy version of Azor High, which is, by the way, how a lot of the Starks look in terms of symbolism. Um, so, yes, I, I do think uh, that we could see Hodor wielding what I'd really like to see is Hodor wheeling Oathkeeper or Widow's Whale, since that is ice, you know, the Stark sword. But he could definitely use Dark Sister as well. Yeah, so we're, somebody's going to use it. I feel it. like the larger swords would work better with Hodor, and the smaller sword would fit better with Mira or a Slider Fighter. Like, Hodor should be wielding, like, a long sword or a broad, you know what I mean? Not like a dagger sword. Well, maybe if we're really doing wish fulfillment, we can imagine that Gendry is going to reforge ice from Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper, and then Bran will warg Hodor, and Hodor will wield it like it was meant to be wielded by a giant. Because those are giant swords. They're six feet long. So, heard it here done and done. first. Uh, that's not going to happen. All right. So, how did you get through the wall? How here we get to the Black Gate stuff, right? Um, Jojen demanded as Sam struggled to his feet. Does the well lead to an underground river? Is that where you came from? Foreshadowing, by the way. I believe that's how they will leave Blood Raven's cave. Uh, I think I think Quinn thought of this on a stream that we were doing, but Mira knows how to make boats from reeds and stuff. So little weirwood bark, some branches. I think I think Mira could make a little boat. We know there's a river in Blood Raven's cave, um, and it may run all the way back here to the bottom of this well. Like it literally, that's the water that they hear passing by down there. It could be part of that river. It could take them to Deep Lake, which is where the wildlings came up uh, when Gendel and Gorn attacked the wall. Uh, it could go all the way to the Winterfell Crypts if you really want to get nuts. So there's some foreshadowing for that. Yeah. I think the, the salty nature of it too suggests that it's connected to that under underground river versus some other surface water. Like oh. We don't hear about salt water anywhere on the surface. Um, salty nature of what? The wall? No, the when he goes through the mouth, the, the water that drips on him is salty. And salt water can't freeze. And so it has to be coming from the underground river and not from a surface water source. Oh, I didn't think about that that i didn't think about where that water came from i just figured it was like condensation or melt water from the wall above so you're saying our underground it's salty so it, our underground no, river salty saying, well i'm saying like everything above that is frozen salt water can't freeze so the salt water has to be coming from somewhere other than the surface where everything's frozen so if it's below ground and that underwater river is brackish because it feeds into the ocean at certain points, especially up there. It probably it probably cuts into the ocean or touches the ocean closer than it would in the riverlands and some of the places further south where it's farther out to get to the ocean. Hmm. Up there, it's pretty narrow by the wall, hmm. and uh, the salt water 
like it that he tastes is you know salt water isn't usually surface water you don't see salt water on the surface like that yeah um there are salt water lakes cinnabarb says and it is usually warmer underground so it wouldn't have to be salt water necessarily um yeah, now I need to do a bunch of research on underground aquifers and stuff. But the point is, this is more of a fantasy idea. This is a Narnia thing. Um, the silver chair, um, you know, th that's what this is about. The idea that there might be an underground passage, speaking of Kronos and Father Time, um, all the way back, you know, to Winterfell. That would mirror uh, the silver chair very much. So if, for those of you who know that. <clears throat> but we'll see. Like I said, just keep your eye on it. it. If you think about the idea of Hodor, not Hodor, but just Mira and Bran escaping from Blood Raven's cave on foot, all that distance, like maybe Cold Hands will show up and help them or whatever, but it might make more sense without, because again, they had Hodor to carry Bran. Hodor is probably going to be stuck somewhere holding a door, either. Maybe the Black Gate door, maybe at Blood Raven's Cave, who knows? But at some point, they're going to be without Hodor. So, yeah, the Underground River would make more sense if it's just Mira and Bran, because Mira can make a boat. Yeah, she could put her water skills to use. Exactly. And that would make sense. It's like they've been building up all these skills, like her climbing skill is coming to use here at the wall. But we haven't seen her make a boat yet. Um, anyway, let's see. How did you get through the wall? Does the well lead to an underground river? Is that where you came from? You're not even wet. There's a gate, said Fat Sam. I <laughs> keep calling him Fat. Jeez, George. He d That's what I'm saying, man. Anyways, a hidden gate. <laughs> yeah, we'll psychoanalyze George another time. A hidden gate, as old as the wall itself. The black gate, he called it. See, and I would say, old. you know, as old as the wall, potentially older than, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, the reeds exchanged to look. We'll find this gate at the bottom of the well, asked Jojen. Sam shook his head. You won't. I have to take you. Why, Mira demanded. If there's a gate, you won't find it. And if you did, it wouldn't open. Not for you. It's the black gate. Sam plucked at the faded black wool of, on his sleeves. Only a man of the Night's Watch can open it, he said. A sworn brother who has said his words. He said, Jojen frowned. This cold hands? That wasn't his true name, said Gilly, rocking. We only called him that, Sam and me. His hands were as cold as ice, but he saved us from the dead men, him and his ravens, and he brought us here on his elk. His elk, said Bran, wonderstruck. His elk, said Mira, startled. His ravens, said Jojen. Hodor, said Hodor. Was he green, Bran wanted to know. Did he have antlers? The fat man was confused. The elk? Cold hands, said Bran impatiently. The green men ride on elks, old Nan used to say. Sometimes they have antlers, too. He wasn't a green man. He wore blacks like a brother of the Night's Watch. But he was as pale as a white, with hands so cold that at first I was afraid. The whites have blue eyes, though, and they don't have tongues, or they've forgotten how to use them. The fat man turned to Jojen. He'll be waiting. We should go. Do you have anything warmer to wear? The black gate is cold, and the other side of the wall is even colder. You... Why didn't he come with you? Mira gestured towards Gilly and her babe. They came with you. Why not him? Why didn't you bring him through the Black Gate too? Will you pick it up here? Yes. He, he can't. Why not? The wall. The wall is more than just ice and stone, he said. There are spells woven into it. Old ones and strong. He cannot pass beyond the wall. It grew very quiet in the castle kitchen then. Bran could hear the soft crackle of the flames, the wind stirring the leaves in the night, the creak of the skinny weirwood reaching for the moon. Beyond the gates, monsters live. And the giants and ghouls, he remembered the old man saying, but they cannot pass so long as the wall stands strong. So go to sleep, my little Brandon, my baby boy. You needn't fear. There are no monsters here. I'm not the one you were told to bring, Jojen Reed told Fat Sam in his stained and baggy blacks. He is. Oh. Sam looked down at him uncertainly. 
It might have been just then that he realized Bran was crippled. I don't... I'm not strong enough to carry you. I... Hodor can carry me, Bran pointed at the basket. I ride in that, up on his back. Sam was staring at him. You're Jon Snow's brother, the one who fell. No, said Jojen. That boy is dead. Don't tell, Bran warned. Please. Sam looked confused for a moment, but finally he said, I, I can't keep a secret. Gilly too. When he looked at her, the girl nodded. J John was my brother too. He was the best friend I ever had, but he went off with Corn Halfhand to scout the Frost Fangs and never came back. He was waiting. We were waiting for him on the fist when. When. And then go ahead and stop. James. I'll, I'll, um, yeah. Let me see here. Uh, there was something. Yeah, a Jojen saying that boy is dead. There's been a lot of dead brand symbolism. He talked about his dead legs. And here, here uh, Jojen calls Bran dead. Um, so this is, you know, it's more ominous foreshadowing, again, of Bran fulfilling his fate. But it's also showing, like, to be a green seer, you kind of are going beyond the land of the living. And that's why Blood Raven's Cave is full of bones and stuff. Like, you're straddling the veil between life and death very much. And again, that's an Odin principle. Uh, but you just, this is just more of that here with uh with with dead bran if you will um and then it says let's see john's here bran said summer saw him he was with some wildlings but they killed a man and john took his horse and escaped i bet he went on to castle black sam turned big eyes on mira you're certain it was john you saw him so sam thinks that john is dead so sam is very excited to hear this that's that's what's going on here I'm Mira, Mira said with a smile. Summer is a shadow detached from the broken dome above and leapt down through the moonlight. Even with his injured leg, the wolf landed as light and quiet as a snowfall. The girl, Gilly, made a frightened sound and clutched her babe so hard against her that it began to cry again. So that's astronomy symbolism. We've seen the moon almost get pulled down through the dome. Now we have a wolf jumping through the moonlight and landing like a snowfall. So this, to me, is foreshadowing of the next moon disaster, which will trigger the next long night, which will basically land with a snowfall. Or I guess you could say that even the fiery moon meteors of the first long night eventually caused a snowfall. So the point is, the snowfall comes when the moon falls through the ceiling, you know, so... Yeah, there you go. It's a wolf meteor. I mean, they're also describing it like a shade, like it, you know how they describe oh a shadow detached itself. Shade. Yeah, and shades are like a ghost, and if it's if it's Bran's ghost that's coming back to Earth, you know, it could be speaking on Bran's you know journey out of his body and then back in or into Hodor. It could be talking about the John thing where you kind of live on in, in the shadow of your wolf, you know, it representing your death existence. And Shade. then, of course, on top of that, the wolf's name is Summer. So it's a summer snow that's landing. And the whole thing about summer snows is, like, that's the long night. When it snows in the summer, that's not, like, that's not good. That's unnatural. <laughs> so I think that's what, when George says summer snows, I think that's, essentially a cryptic way of, of talking about broken seasons. So, mm -hmm. he won't hurt you, Bran said. That's summer. John said you all had wolves. Sam pulled off a glove. I know Ghost. He held out a shaky hand, fingers white and soft and fat as little sausages. Summer padded closer, sniffed them, and gave the hand a lick. That was when Bran made up his mind. We'll go with you. See, Bran's a smart Stark. He knows to trust his dog. All of you? Sam seemed surprised by that. Mir ruffled Bran's hair. He's our prince. Summer circled the well, sniffing. He paused by the top step and looked back at Bran. He wants to go. Will Gilly be safe? Oh, so... Do you think it's possible that... When we get, you know, how did the, um, the direwolf mama, 
that we see in the early chapters of Game of Thrones. How did it get through the wall? Um, some people think that it was Blood Raven or Cold Hands that guided the wolf through the through the wall. Um, and so maybe 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 this has happened before with the wolf coming through the well. Um, but yeah, I don't know. The, in any case, Summer senses the destiny at hand and wants to, you know, embrace it. So, um, let's see. Will Gilly be safe if I leave her here till I come back? Sam asked them. She should be, said Mira. She's welcome to our fire. Jojen said, the castle is empty. Gilly looked around. Craster used to tell us of castles, but I never knew they'd be so big. It's only the kitchens. Bran wondered what she'd think when she saw Winterfell, if she ever did. It took them a few minutes to gather their things and hoist Bran into his wicker seat on Hodor's back. By the time they were ready to go, Gilly sat nursing her babe by the fire. You'll come back for me, she said to Sam. As soon as I can, he promised. Then we'll go somewhere warm. When he heard that, part of Bran wondered what he was doing. Will I ever go someplace warm again? So, you know, again, the, the ominous foreshadowing. I'll go first. I know the way. And that's maybe like the creepiest, creepiest thing you can have, actually. Somebody coming out of the place where you're going saying, just take me somewhere warm. Like, oh, God. <laughs> <clears throat> Yikes. So. It's not a good thing. Uh, will you pick it up with I'll go first? I'll go first. I know the way. Sam hesitated at the top. There's just so many steps, he sighed before he started down. Jojen followed, then Summer, then Hodor with Bran riding on his back. Mira took the rear with the spear and net in hand. It was a long way down. The top of the well was bathed in moonlight, but it grew smaller and dimmer every time they went around. Their footsteps echoed off the damp stones and the water sounds grew louder. Should we have brought torches, Jojen asked. Your eyes will adjust, Sam said. Keep one hand on the wall and you won't fall. The well grew darker and colder with every turn. When Bran finally lifted his head around to look back up the shaft, the top of the well was no bigger than a half moon. Hodor? Hodor. Hodor so just real quick, I just want to point out, they've come a long way down the well for the top of it, 12 feet across, remember, now looks as tiny as the moon. Like, they've got to be 80 feet or something below the ground or more. But go ahead. Hodor, 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 Hodor. The well whispered back. The water sounds were close, but when Bran peered down, he saw only blackness. A turn or two later, Sam stopped suddenly. He was quarter of the way down... He was quarter of the way around the well from Bran and Hodor and six feet farther down. Bran could barely see him. He could see the door, though. The Black Gate, Sam had called it, but it wasn't black at all. It was white weirwood, and there was a face on it. A yeah, let me pick this the... up here. <clears throat> a glow came from the wood, like milk and moonlight, so faint it scarcely seemed to touch anything but the door itself, not even Sam standing right before it. So, milk and moonlight, these are others' words. Um, they're, they have milk-white flesh. Their swords glow in the moonlight. Um, it's just more the what I was talking about, where weirwoods and others, they you know, George uses all the same language to talk about them so that we know uh, that there's a connection. Uh, so it says... Uh, the face was old and pale, wrinkled and shrunken. It looks dead. Its mouth was closed and its eyes. Its cheeks were sunken, its brow withered, its chin sagging. If a man could live for a thousand years and never die but just grow older, his face might come to look like that. And that might be a very literal description of what this door is. But let me just finish the chapter and we can talk about it. The door opened its eyes. They were white, too, and blind. So not, not bloody here. It's different. Who are you? The door asked. And the well whispered, Who, who, who? I am the sword in the darkness, Samuel Tarley said. I am the watcher on the walls. I am the fire that burns against the cold, the light that brings the dawn, the horn that wakes the sleepers. 
I am the shield that guards the realms of men. Then pass, the door said. Its lips opened, wide and wider and wider still, until nothing at all remained but a great gaping mouth in a ring of wrinkles. Sam, it's very fantasy all of a sudden. Sam stepped aside and waved Jojen through ahead of him. Summer followed, sniffing as he went, and then it was Bran's turn. Hodor ducked, but not low enough. The door's upper lip brushed softly against the top of Bran's head, and a drop of water fell on him and ran slowly down his nose. It was strangely warm and salty as a tear. So there you go. There it is. The Freaky Deaky Black it. Gate. Salty tears, salty water coming from the mouth. So, I, like I said, I interpret that to be mostly poetic. As far as the salt, it implies it as a tear, and it implies, um, uh, like you know, like you were saying that there's a sorrow and a tragedy here. But you, but I guess there is. We should ask, like physically, where does this warm water come from? I mean, it has to come from the weirwood face, right? I'm thinking that if there's warmth coming from below, like if it's in a well, like if it's actually a well. And he came up and he was soaking wet when he came up. Like Sam Tarley's splashing around like he's soaking wet, flipping and flopping around like a wet fish. He's not just like, they don't talk about him swimming before or anything, but he's, it's like he's covered in water and he came out of the hole. I'm wondering if it's like, there's a lot of moisture down there that we don't get much of a description other than all it takes is you grazing your head to actually get wet from how wet that environment is. And uh, the heat could be creating the drip. If any of that is salt water, that's frozen. If, if like she said, it's heated below. I wonder, yeah, there's, it could be, a, I, th- I would think if there's a hot spring, it would be more obvious. I mean, we, we see those at Winterfell. Um, I, I would say that the heat source is the weirwood organism itself, but, it's a mystery. I mean, this whole thing is a mystery. Like, what the fuck? These faces have never moved before. They've never talked. They've never opened their eyes. So we don't even know what this is. That's why I say it's a weirwood organism. This might not be a normal tree. Maybe the trees have faces down below the earth too. But it's hard to say. Is this a green seer? in a cave that froze in place and just merged with the wood like blood raven in a thousand years would look like this i don't know um we're left to wonder so yeah i think uh i think that would make a lot of sense i mean if i would think you know in in the beginning they were worshiping they were worshiping trees and if I was going to pick a type of tree to worship, like if, if I was looking around trying to decide which one of these trees were ones that were worshiped as gods, which ones were just altars, which ones, you know, were a sign of a former culture that really held these trees in high regard. This one above all others, I would say is one that represents like the tree being a God that like speaks and holds, you know, holds people back and, uh, it's, it's a very epic uh, version of everything we've seen before this. Yeah, um, and there's also the other comparison that I've made is the Grey King, to your point. Um, when he says somebody that could live for a thousand years and never die, the Grey King was said to live for a thousand years, and that's why he's called the Grey King, because he turned gray and wooden and corpse-like. So the Grey King has all kinds of green seer symbolism around him. I'm very sure that he was a green seer figure. So this, this, I'm not saying this is the Grey King. I mean, I don't know that we're supposed to think like that, you know? Um, this, it's more like the story of the Grey King describes an old green seer. Uh, and the idea of living for a thousand years and never dying, that could be what we're looking at here. Some sort of hybridization with the Weirwood. It could even be different than what Blood Raven is doing. Um, but it could be the original, like uncorrupted version of merging a person with the trees, whereas the the one that Blood Raven's going through looks like a corrupted version of that process, where the tree is like going through him as opposed to him going into the tree. 
Yeah, and that makes me think of maybe the face carving up above is being done in imitation of this kind of a natural weird face. Um, something like that is, is possible as well. Because this isn't carved. This face isn't bleeding. You know, it's a different kind of face. And the, I mean, when they were carving the faces into the weirwoods, it was part of the agreement in the pact, right? To like allow the faces like on the trees. Wasn't that part of the agreement? I mean, it's really sketchy. And I think a lot of that's bullshit. Um, but it says that the faces were carved on the Isle of Faces when they made the pact. That's what it says. Um, so the gotcha. gods can bear witness. But that's obviously, a, that's, a, that's not all bullshit, but it's definitely a scrambled memory. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think that's that essentially Azor Ahai and Nissa Nissa happened on the Isle of Faces. And that's why they think of the Hammer of the Waters as being called down from there through an act of blood sacrifice. The Hammer of the Waters is a moon meteor. Azor Ahai killing Nissa Nissa is a blood sacrifice. All the clues say that Nissa Nissa was a child of the forest. So that, that gives you a dragon lord, Azor Ahai, sacrificing Nissa Nissa and probably other green men or children on the Isle of Faces to break the moon and call down the hammer. Um, that is what I think happened. And I think the face carving is, again, a corrupted practice. It's something that Azor Ahai did because I don't think he was a natural green seer. I think he was trying to break into the Weirwoods to steal their power. And I think the face carving is his doorway. That's his entryway that he carved. Um, so I think there was an original weirwood usage that wasn't all messed up. Um, and it, it should look more natural. Like you hear of that, uh, uh, the, the, the throne, the, the oaken seat down in the yeah. reach. It's a living wooden oak throne that's above ground. Kind of sounds like a green seer throne, but the green seer thrones are below ground in the dark. So what is this oaken seat? Well, maybe that's like original green man tree technology, right? Go ahead. What are your thoughts yeah. on all that madness? Yeah. Well, I think that wasn't that the symbol too of like uh, Garth Greenhand's, uh, maybe not his castle, but his sigil. Wasn't it like a green face carved into a tree or something like? That? I no, I think it's just a green hand. Symbol. Okay. Was there a symbol for, that was a green face? I feel like I'm remembering it from something in the histories, but maybe that's just me. It could be some of the art, artwork you've looked at. But um, the point is that Garth is described as being a green man, and he's his son is sitting on this oaken seat. So it sounds like original weirwood tech that isn't all bloodthirsty and creepy and dead. You know, it's like Garth is a robust fertility god version of a green man and his son's throne is you know, like i said not in a cave it's a living throne up you know up in the sunshine it's very nice it sounds picturesque i got you uh i with the yeah i know we're probably wrapping i heard minty getting hungry uh, yeah no i'm very hungry we're, we're about to wrap this up when the chapter's done now so final thoughts yes yeah uh the horn thing that you had mentioned earlier, uh, towards the end, they were talking about cold hands and the fact that he rode an elk and they were wondering like whether he was green and whether he had horns or not. And they're like, no, 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 he's in blacks. And it made me wonder about the sentinels because we had mentioned earlier about the, the horns and stuff and the, the brothers of the night night's watch kind of carrying that symbolism of the green man, uh, it was kind of calling that back a little bit to me. So I, and I'm putting this together now. I have always believed, um, the green man symbolism is all over the night's watch. I mean, they've got Rangers named like John Barleycorn and shit. Like it's heavy. Okay. Um, and even Jon Snow is called the corn King, right? So like the night's watch is heavily spelled out as being dead skin changers green seers now john is going to be a dead skin changer night's watchman and cold hands probably is because the way he talks to the ravens and controls the elk so i have theorized that the first night's watchmen were in fact resurrected skin changers um and they were they were all zombies 
the last hero's dirty dozen, if you will, that they were all zombie rangers. Because zombie rangers like Cold Hands or soon to be Jon Snow are ideal for journeying into the cold lands and facing the others because they're, they're not troubled by the cold and they don't need to eat, sleep, or rest, which are all the things that kill human beings in the north. So they're green men in the sense that they are using the green man gifts. But it could be that some of those original rangers were actually green men because we don't know what the green men were. We don't know how humanoid they were if humans and green men were, were hybrids of some kind, if they made hybrids, or if it's just that these rangers were resurrected by the green men, or just that they were using the green men powers of skin changing. But the green men symbolism is draped all over the watch. Symbolically, they are like dead green men. And so that's the most sense that I could make out of it, essentially, is just looking at John and Cold Hands. I was like, oh, dead skin changers. That's what it's at. Because the thing about the skin changer part is it preserves the soul so you can make a better zombie because the soul doesn't just dissipate like Barrack or Lady Stoneheart, but just goes over into the animal and starts merging with the animal. So you take the animal human spirit, put it back in the person, and that's what's going to happen to John. And now you've got a, a white that is conscious. And that's what Cold Hands is. He's a cold white, but he's in control. He's like repossessed his own body, kind of. So... That's my that green man theory. With, um, but yeah, it's everywhere. The symbolism is everywhere. It lines up with what we were talking about earlier with there being like at the wall, if the night fort was an old order of the green hand site and that that was like their duty was to hold the watch there. Yes. That what this is telling us is that yes, a hundred percent. That was what was there. Like it, we have these people walking around that, Jojen and them are confusing for green men. Like we're being told that 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 is probably that uh, the purpose that we were talking about earlier that 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 may have been behind the night fort and the original group that was there, and why that oath was put on the gate. Um, that makes a ton of sense. That makes a ton of sense. That original order the sacred order of the green men. They guard weirwoods. That's what they do. They guard the weirwoods on the Isle of Faces. So all we're speculating is that they guarded other weirwoods in ancient day, one of which being this weirwood at the night fort. That makes perfect sense. And then you get... Um, uh, then you get... Uh, a sensible resolution of all this symbolism. You know, that's why the Night's, the Night's Watch was formed out of green men... They were either resurrected by green men priests or they were undead green men, undead skin changers. And that's why there's a weirwood organism at the center of all this at the Night Fort. And Night's King himself, probably a green seer or a skin changer or something like that as well. I mean, that's that's not hard to guess, I don't think. And I think that's why we're getting like I think that's why these couple of brand chapters are so heavily laden with the cold hand stuff and all like there's no reason that we're being told the history of the wall and the night fort and all that through Bran's eyes. Like we're, I feel like we're learning it through that perspective for a reason. Like I think him telling us up, telling us this right. up at the wall in that place is for a reason through him with Mira and Jojen there being so like green, the symbolism is us trying to understand what, like where the disconnect is. And I think this is kind of the, or this chapter and the other one with cold hands are very helpful for putting those together. Yeah, you're totally right. Again, just step back and see what, what you're being shown. An undead Night's Watch Ranger, you know, using the Black Gate, manning, you know, at the Night Fort, and that, that Bran thinks might be a green man. So it's like, yeah, that's probably kind of what happened originally. So very cool. Thanks for helping me putting that together. I was just a couple of steps away, but the idea that the original Night's Watch is the sacred order of green men and that they were up at the Night Fort makes a ton of sense. So I'll have to work on refining that idea and uh, see where it I get with it. makes sense why their oath would work on a weirwood. What's that? Why, why it works on... It makes sense why their oath works on trees. Like right, and the Night's Watch, they pray to the weirwoods anyway. Like when John and Sam give their vows, 
in the way that all the first men, Night's Watchmen, gave their vows. They pray to the trees. That's who they give their oath to and say, I will defend the realms of men. So the Night's Watch has always been implied as being form, you know, created by the Green Seers. Uh, and it says in the histories, it says that the children of the forest helped the first rangers of the Night's Watch assemble and also that they helped the last hero. So, yeah. Um, and then real quick, let me get a couple of super chats uh, before we get out of here. Jay Lord is talking about the Starks and the Pearl Emperor, which is great Empire of the Dawn stuff. Um, you know, Ned's got gray eyes and wears white silk while sitting on the Iron Throne, kind of like a Pearl Emperor. A lot of people have compared the, the Pearl Emperor to the Starks, but it's that's way down the rabbit hole. I don't have, I can't get into that right now. Um, yeah, I mean, connecting the Starks to the Great Empire of the Dawn is really thin. So I, I really haven't gone there um, too much. Kelly Johnson says, these theories getting deep, deep into the mythos. Yes, yes, we did. We fell down the rabbit hole today for sure, as I knew we would. Good old Slappy McGee with just a super chat. Thank you. Super sticker. Two super stickers. Very good. So thank you. And uh, yeah, with that, I will... Remind you to check out Talk Studios. The link is in the description. I checked. It is the right link, despite what Carl Karstark yeah, yeah. was saying. <laughs> and, um, yeah, thanks for coming on. And, uh, yeah, this has been a deep dive. You, I've had people asking for the, the old school myth. So here you go. There it was. And now I'm going to go eat. I'm so hungry, guys. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Good to cool. chat again. Sorry, like I was, chat again. there's a there's a delay. Uh, what you just you just said thanks and bye and that's it. I thought you were saying something else. Okay then. Well, I'll see you later. All right, bye. All right, cheers, guys. <laughs> thanks for tuning in, everyone. And uh, I'll be back with the Jaharis and Alisan video in uh, two or three days, and then I'll be at the con, and I'll tell you all about that. So, you know, subscribe to the channel, all that stuff. All right, cheers. I need food. Later.